Hello to everybody. We're just assembling everybody. Well, it's nearly five past one. In fact, it is five past one now. So um, let's get started. Uh, um, so I, my name is Professor Hugh Rickards. I'm the chair of the executive committee of the Huntington's Association of England and Wales. And this is our 50th anniversary meeting. So we've got lots of goodies lined up for you today. Um, and it's just great to see so many people registered and attending. So what we're here to do today is we're really here to uh, tell you about the work of the charity. And today we've got include, including in that a historical perspective, but also to talk to you about what we've been doing in the last year, particularly because that's part of our statutory duty. Uh, we've got to tell you about uh, our financial position, which is pretty healthy at the moment. Uh, to formally appoint trustees and to formally appoint auditors. Once we get going with the main bits of the talks, uh, please ask questions in the chat and Helen is going to collate those all together and sort of ask them to me as we go or ask them to the speakers as they go. We might not be able to answer all the questions because we're fairly on a fairly tight time scale, but we will provide answers to all the questions either today in the meeting or later in a sort of Q&A document. So, first things first, I have, I, it's my job to tell you about what we've been doing as an association in the last year. So that's what I'm just about to do. And in order to do that, I will share my screen and hopefully that will just come up very shortly. Um, so can I just hear from tech? Is my screen being shared now? Perfect, you. Okay, lovely. Hi, everybody. I can relax a little bit now because my the, the main tech job has been done. So it's my job to tell you um, what we've been doing in the last year and really to uh, give you a flavour of the things uh, that the Huntington's Association of England and Wales has been getting up to. So I want to talk to you first about the Specialist Huntington's Advisory Service uh, because that's one of the central things of what we do. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about what those people have been doing over the last year, particularly during the COVID times and started to come out of the COVID times. Um, so it's just to give you a flavour of the amount of contact we have over the year. Um, within this last financial year, we've had 750 odd uh, new referrals, not including the people we already have. And we've seen over 4,000 people given advice and information to them. Um, one way or another. This is the specialist advisors, which is a huge amount of work. Um, just to give you a flavour of the sorts of people we're seeing and they're giving advice to, it's mainly adults with Huntington's disease, but you can see there's a smattering of other sorts of people. Uh, the next highest is carers for people with HD, uh, but also a good amount of uh, adults at risk and also um, a bunch of young people too. So that gives you a flavour of who we are seeing and supporting and giving advice to or well, the SHDAs are doing that. Um, alongside that, the SHDAs, of course, with COVID have moved to a virtual world. And so a lot of what they're doing is over the internet, or either video calls or phone calls, but also attending clinical meetings like multidisciplinary team meetings. It's very common to see an SHDA at a multidisciplinary meeting, advocating and sharing information with the clinical teams. Um, there have been virtual uh, specialist Huntington's advisors sur surgeries. So that's sort of like a uh, with an SHDA there for people to call in and uh, get advice about all sorts of things and a full range of webinars. And we'll be talking about the webinars later, but certainly I found those really helpful. And I found finding out about them on Instagram and other social media really useful. Um, there have also been uh, specific online support sessions for particular groups, for instance, juvenile Huntington's disease um, for patients and their families, usually parents. As you might imagine, the helpline has been really busy this year. Um, but what we've also done is ask people what they think about it. And you can see um, that we've had a really good positive feedback from the helpline. That's the sort of phone call plus email. You see the amount of emails that we have to deal with, giving advice, information, signposting, um, it's phenomenal, really. Okay, moving on. I want to talk briefly about the youth engagement service, which is something that we're developing. Um, 
really it's about supporting young people and that might be young people with Huntington's disease but it also includes people who are at risk or who are wondering about uh, genes or maybe have siblings also um, who are at risk or maybe have the disease. So this year we supported 212 young people in England and Wales and had uh, 56 new referrals into that service uh, and created a Facebook page so we can interact with um, young people over social media too. So that's a new or sort of a, a, a developing part of what we what we offer as a, a charity. Okay, online activities. This has been a real change, I think. We've been um, forced more online because of the pandemic. We've actually found a lot of things we can do very usefully there. And so I guess coming out of pandemic, we have to decide which of those things um, we keep or change, uh, not necessarily go exactly back to the old ways. So I guess, firstly, the website is busy and popular, and we've tried to uh, develop it so that when people land on the first page, they've got resources and information that they can get quickly and easily without having to hunt around for it. We're also using the website as a hub for certain professional groups, for instance, occupational therapists. Um, thanks to our new, new social media coordinator, um, we're really developing our presence on social media Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, and you can see the number of people that follow us on those different um, platforms, particularly Facebook. Uh, personally, Instagram is my personal favourite because it gives you very quick and easy information and signposting. Um, and pretty much every day there's something new on there. Um, there's a range of other things that you can see in terms of our internet presence, including blogs, advertisements for um, webinars and other events. All sorts of information sharing and of course fundraising um, happens a lot on social media and on the internet and that's the modern world that we live in uh, and very effective too. Um, a little bit about welfare and community support. Um, we provide a, a small number of grants for people as a central organisation and these are the sorts of things that um, people are asking for and that we're uh, giving grants for. This isn't the list of all of them, this is just an example of two or three of the sorts of things uh, that, that we've given small grants for. This also applies to the local branches and support groups who are a sort of bedrock really, and uh, keeping things, they're keeping things going during the pandemic uh, in their own ways, um, but they've also been making uh, local welfare grants throughout the uh, financial year, and also moved a lot of their activities online just really to be a lifeline and the support uh, to people and families in a local way, uh, particularly during the pandemic. And so I think uh, a particular shout out to the branches and support groups for all the work they do in that area. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about partnership working because um, there is more to the Huntington's Association and the Specialist Huntington's Advisory Service. Um, this just gives you a flavour of the sorts of things that we're getting involved with now. And it's about finding gaps in policy, um, finding gaps in networks and trying to build together a coalition of people and stakeholders who, with the aim of getting integrated good services for people with Huntington's disease. Um, as part of that, and in association with Roche, we've started a mapping exercise of all the clinical services in the UK. We've pretty much finished data gathering for all of that. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to report on that before too long. But you can see a, a bunch of the other things that we're being asked to consult on, for instance, reviewing support provided in prison. There was a new review of the Mental Health Act, which really uh, can affect people with HD, particularly later on in the illness. Um, NHS are looking at unmet mental health, NHS England are looking at un unmet mental health needs, uh, and we're uh, chipping in, in in that in relation to Huntington's disease. The British Psychological Society have written guidelines about psychological therapy, and obviously we've been helping there. Um, also the Neurological Alliance, which is a group of neurological charities. Um, Kath has now become a trustee of that group, and we, it's a really important area for us to find out how the other charities are doing and to find areas where we can collaborate with them, particularly when it comes to regulatory authorities in relation to new drugs licensing and uh, 
uh, nice mechanisms and things like that. But also in terms of the charity structure, um, there has been a number of reviews of neurological services over the last couple of years. And of course, it's really important as Huntington's disease sort of sits between a bunch of different services, whether that's neurology or mental health, it's really important to make sure that it doesn't get neglected in those discussions. Um, I won't go through all of these in a list, but I guess what it shows you is that alongside the care and support work we do, we also have a really important policy role, which is understanding you know, what, what policies are being made, where the gaps are in the services, um, and how we can really have a seat at the table when these things get uh, decided, whether that's to do with insurance or ben benefits or pensions or the armed forces or driving. Um, you know, all of these things are things that need policies making and thinking about that we have to really um, be a part of. The other thing that we're getting used to is working with pharma companies and biotech companies. Now, the last time I heard, which was yesterday, I think there are, at last count, 24 different pharma or bio companies with a significant interest in Huntington's disease that is uh, related to the UK, but also the rest of the world. So that is actually gobsmacking and a real game change um, that we're now, there are 24 companies who really need us and are, are ringing us up and asking for advice and wanting to interface with us and collaborate with us. So we should really welcome that but it also brings an extra workload that we really have to think about. And it's a new set of interactions that we haven't been used to over the last few years. Okay. Right, it's gonna talk about increasing knowledge and understanding now. Well, the first thing is uh, we've, we've got a bunch of guides now, which are available on the website, including a COVID-19 resource, which is HD specific, but that's really important but also we've got some new guides out there to do with genetic testing and help for older carers. And the webinars that we've run um, have been greatly successful. Some of these are for other professionals and some of them are for patients and carers and families. But also uh, these, work, these uh, training sessions for professionals particularly have had great feedback. And on top of all that, we have our twice yearly magazine which goes out to all of our members. It's a lot of work. Um, on social media particularly, we've done a lot to raise awareness and I've just put on a bunch of hashtags um, for people. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what they all are. Maybe you wanna go and explore some of those for yourself. And um, you can also see that we have to interact with the media in terms of scripts for soap operas, dramas, um, and sometimes news broadcasts. I noticed even this morning, in the Guardian magazine this morning, there's a really moving piece by a journalist, Charlotte Raven, about her Huntington's disease. And these are the sorts of things that we're asked to comment on and we should be commenting on and give advice to make sure that the storylines are accurate and reflect the HD community. Ooh, just checking the time. Okay, I guess we can't have this talk without some, um, reference to COVID-19, and here we are talking about COVID-19, because it has changed the organisation, I think, um, and we've really had to think on our feet this year. The first thing to say is that um, we ended up having to make the decision to furlough 15 staff, um, which was a big, big change, um, and to look after those uh, people who were working from home and also the furloughed staff, and to move activities online, so we pretty much went 100% online, the start of the pandemic. Then of course there was the challenge of maintaining our funding streams and that, that involved uh, a bunch of different maneuvers which I guess Nick is going to talk about in his talk a little bit more. Because we weren't really allowed into nursing homes at all, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic and that's only just started to open up now, we had to pause our nursing home accreditation scheme because it just wasn't practical to do that in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but that, that's something we hope to uh, pick up and run again with once things start to open up. And then we have to do very practical things like making our own office COVID secure um, at the same time as moving offices. So that's been quite a challenge in Liverpool. Okay, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about research. I 
guess what's happened in the year. I think the first thing to say is that um, we've, we've had a disappointment in terms of the stopping of both the Gen HD and the Position HD trials, both for very different reasons. And the fact that they both stopped at a very similar time is a complete coincidence. Um, and I guess that's something that we're going to hear more about this afternoon uh, from Ed Wilde, who's going to uh, do one of our research updates. For me, I guess the message is it's, it's a real disappointment, and I think we're still coming to terms with that disappointment, but it's not a back to square one. And I've been using the analogy of snakes and ladders to say, you know, we've hit, we've gone down the snake, but we've maybe gone down from square 80 to about square 60. We haven't gone down to square one again. There's so much that we've learned and there's so much we can now do. I was at the site investigators meeting yesterday for the UK and every speaker now, all the scientists, they say, well, we take it for granted now that we can lower Huntington in people's brains in a fairly reliable way. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something you know, that's not even arguable anymore. It's like, yeah, we can reduce Huntington, to, Huntington protein in people's brains. It's just accepted. The question is, can we do it in a safe way that doesn't do anything else harmful at the same time? And what does that look like? So the debate has really moved on um, in a way that would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago. Um, we continue to support HD Buzz as a really um, accurate and what they say, written by scientists for non-scientists. I think that's a really good way of describing HD Buzz. And that's a really good source of information for our members in terms of what's happening in research. And as a charity, we're starting to develop our links with pharma companies and biotech companies and realizing the potentials of that and also the risks of that, but also accepting that we really do have to engage with that. We're also seeing that there are gaps. If we think the end, the basic idea of doing this research for disease modifying therapies so that people can get treated with disease modifying therapies. And we're, we, we can see now that there are gaps in this chain particularly in terms of health economics and burden of care and quality of life measurement. And so this is something that we're really trying to support. So as and when the uh, effective disease modifying therapies get licensed, there's not a big hold up in preventing people getting hold of them. We're also able to provide a voice for research uh, projects from the patients and their families and their carers through our own HD voice program. And I was I sat on it as a researcher um, about two weeks ago, and I was really impressed by the quality and the depth of the perspectives that that HD voice prescribed, uh, provided for us planning our own research project, if you like. Um, and we're building up a really good bank of people that can do that work. Um, okay, then a little bit about fundraising, although I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but really to say um, that COVID has had to make us hyper um, creative in terms of our fundraising. We've really had to, all sorts of things like marathons and jumping out of planes and discos and band parties, that's all just stopped overnight. We've had some COVID emergency funding and I guess Nick will talk about that. But I think the bottom line is um, through careful stewardship and a lot of thought and a lot of creative and hard work, we're in a relatively healthy financial position. Um, and I'm sure Nick will give us the, the, the more of the detail of that shortly. Okay, finally, just to talk about future plans. So we are, our, our current five-year strategy is coming towards an end. And one of our jobs as trustees is to redesign the new strategy for the next five years. And that's something we're actively starting to work on. And hopefully we'll get that pretty much firmed up uh, by Easter, this coming year to come into operation in 2023, um, 2023. I guess we're having to look at what we've done in COVID and say, okay, things are getting a bit more back to normal now, although they're not completely back to normal. How can we keep our best practice? And what have we learned in terms of, particularly in terms of the internet and uh, communicating in this sort of a way that we can take forward? We're going to reconvince our pause projects, for instance, the nursing home accreditation scheme and get recruiting up to capacity. Now we're lucky at this stage in that we have some um, surplus money. And so I think we're going to really look at how we can best use that. But that might include improving the infrastructure of the charity, which is growing. 
uh, a look at areas of policy, particularly. Um, but that's something I think that as trustees will be debating and also we'll be talking to you as members too um, about the, what that might look like. So that's all I wanted to say uh, from the point of view of the chair. Um, I just wonder, is there any other, are there any pressing questions from uh, the tech or the moderator, Ruth or Helen? I don't think there's any questions in queue, so we can carry on. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over, oh no, we're going to talk about, uh, uh, we are formally open the business meeting, that's what we do now. Okay, so firstly, the, normally we do this in person, so we're having to do this online. Um, so this is just for the voting members. The copies of the minutes have been made available on the website, which you can find. Um, and I would propose that the minutes of the 2020 annual general meeting are accepted as an accurate recording. And so uh, could I have a second for that, if possible? Nick, would you be OK to second that? Yes, fine. OK. And I could also tell you that the, because of the nature of the online meeting, this has been put to the members by a proxy vote and the minutes have been accepted by proxy vote. OK, so the next bit of the meeting is to go on to the Treasurer's report. Uh, um, so, Nick, over to you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, at the moment, I'm still seeing. Oh, we, that's right. Excellent. Yep. We're coming up I've stopped right. sharing. Yes, thank you very much. You, 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 ah, oh, look, and I see some accounts in the background, which always brightens my, yes. Uh, anyway, um, this year, as Hugh has been explaining, is, is extraordinary in, in both the, our, our, our operations and in fact, what happened with our accounts. At the beginning of the year, our finance committee, we met regularly based on a very sort of pessimistic and, and prudent outlook on, on what was actually happening. And in fact, the whole developments financially worked out in our favor. And in overall terms, we ended up with, um, if we can bring up page 20 on of the accounts, we ended up with um, an income surplus overall of £656,000, which is an absolutely extraordinary sort of situation, which we we really had no, no feeling which would occur. And you can see at the beginning of the year, the top line, donations and legacies, this year, 1303 against 1151,000 last year. And that just shows how really the, the whole um, basis of the charitable activities in the year changed. Um, what if we go, I think it just to, and it, to illustrate how that worked out, if we can go to page 26, um, which shows the breakdown of that donations and income, um, should be down at the bottom keep going down. Here we go. That's right. Um, right. So we've got donations and gifts, community fundraising. You can see the donations and group are 741,000, which are further broken down below. And the community fundraising fell obviously from 500 odd thousand to 200. Well, we know why that was. And we were thinking, well, where's the rest of the money coming from? But in fact, we ended up getting um, other income of £500,000, which was a lot of individual giving of people who actually um, wanted to support us as a health charity. And together with that, we had the um, rousing uh, charity gave us 80 odd thousand pounds and we had 92 thousand pounds from the government's um, office for civil society which is a sort of recovering to help us recover from the impact of 
um, the pandemic, obviously that our fundraising team made a terrific effort to find these funds and make sure we got in with, with getting, getting the money in on the basis that we were going to be in a desperate position. Uh, well, obviously things turned out very well in that respect. And also we got the grants down a, a line, you can say, see three lines down, which was um, mostly the furlough money of 160 odd thousand pounds. So that money came in to support our paying the staff. But of course, the staff weren't actually able to, uh, the, the furloughed staff weren't actually able to do a lot of things which normally cost us the general running expenses. So the running expenses fell as well. So if we go, which we'll see again on, in the expenses. So if we can go back to page 20 again, Ruth, that would be handy. Yeah, there we go. So going down the screen, the We've got an income up this year, 1.8 million. We get an extra 160,000. We get an extra money from the Office for Civil Society. We get all these other things. And that was just so totally unexpected to us. And I think everybody else really. Um, <clears throat> the fundraising costs um, are stayed approximately the same. But, and of course our charitable activities, which is what we really are doing all the time, um, the cost of those fell substantially. So we can see that in note eight in, in the accounts, which hopefully will come up next, um, Ruth, page 29. Um, there we go. And so you can see there that the, the wage costs, the staff costs fell because we did actually end up with quite a few retirements of people deciding that what, their future was not necessarily working full time for the Huntington's Disease Association. So the, <coughs> the staff costs fell a bit, and then basically um, so many of the other costs fell away because we weren't, weren't actually operating, we weren't, um, a, we weren't having an AGM. Um, you can see down on the right hand side, um, branch activities, obviously th those come into the, to the overall set of the accounts. Um, expenditure fell there as well because people weren't able to do as sort of he was alluded to as we'd gone along. Um, so basically the expenditure fell substantially from um, 1.4 million to 1.1 million. So it basically means that we then ended up, if we go back to page 20 again, showing how we've actually um, ended up with a surplus there of 600 odd thousand pounds. The, the surplus was actually boosted as well by um, some legacies falling in during this year. Um, in particular, approximately 150,000 from, a, from a, a life interest trust, which was dependent on the death of the beneficiary. And so that was another 150,000 uh, we were notified of, of um, uh, so we had an absolute entitlement to the year end, so it's brought into the accounts, but it didn't actually hit the bank balance at the year end. But we're still getting all these things just fortuitously, in a way, of course, uh, fell in during the year. So if we go to the next page, page 21, there's the balance sheet, um, which I, I mean, often one... When you're, when you're running a small business, you want to see how much cash we've got. And that's the key item to everything. And in this case, cash bank in, and in hand, we've got at a year end over a million pounds in cash, which um, together with our 450,000 of investments, um, it puts, in a, puts us in a position which we've never been in the whole 50 years of our association with a massive, um, a massive surplus and a substantial reserve of cash and investments, which makes the treasurer's life so much easier. I mean, this is a, a change from, say, four or five years ago when I ended up with, at one stage, £9,000 in the bank. And this is just um, an extraordinary positive position for us to be in and to decide how we're actually going to make use of these funds going forward. Um, 
our finance committee looked at this, and if you go down to the bottom of the page, you can just wander down a little bit further. Yes, there we go. Um, we've got general funds of 1.4 million pounds, which <clears throat> are unrestricted reserves, basically, our, our reserves. Now, we've always said our reserves should be about six months, five to six months of our annual running expenses. And that came, that's been hovering at about 750,000. We felt that we should um, increase the, uh, our reserve target to a million pounds uh, because the, these times are very uncertain. We are facing uh, uh, considerable inflationary pressures, uncertainty, as we all know. So we felt that was reasonable, but that still left us with 400,000 of unrestricted uh, of reserves, which really were in excess of what our target is and what we what we need to justify why we've got this extra money. And so, um, in the finance committee, we have discussed what we're going to do next and we decide, thought we should in our budget for this coming, this current year, 21, 22, we should aim for a deficit of 200,000. This would then um, flow through again uh, to, the, uh, to the following year. And as you can see, that would, that would eat into that. And also if we, if we said it was a three year project to get to spend this extra 200,000, except that we could have a deficit of 200,000, that would still just push us back towards our original 750,000 reserve target. So that's our proposal, which we have instituted. And that, if I now go on to where we are, where we're going forward, really, um, here was explained how all the different things that need to be done and look forward to where we're going. Um, as they always say, accountants shouldn't always always tend to look backwards rather than look forwards, but we, we are looking forward now and saying, right, we've got the 200,000, we have in place a, a, an approach to spend um, uh, enough money to have a deficit based on the income we got in the current year, which we consider to be sustainable. Um, this, obviously, we've been, we're now six months further on from the year end, and the position has continued to be exceptionally positive. Um, we have had a cash flow into the charity uh, following these legacies which have actually materialized. So we now have approximately 1.4 million of cash in the bank, which is just an extraordinary situation. And the Finance Committee will be recommending um, that we should consider further projects because this money is coming in. We must use it and we must use it in a positive way. Um, and that will be discussed ho hopefully um, today and at the future executive meetings. Um, but I would say and thank the Finance Committee for their efforts in actually coming up with some of these uh, reviewing and helping me as the Treasurer through what I thought was going to be very dark and difficult times, which turned out to be extremely different. Um, I would thank the fundraising team for all their efforts in actually amending their way of operating and developing these innovative ideas, the communications team for doing all their things. And these are the things, the communications, the, the policy and all those sort of things where we need more support. Um, it's not obviously straight helping people on the ground, but it is something we as a, a, a charity, which are now getting quite substantial size, need to spend money on supporting the whole of the operation, the office work, the uh, and our communications and our fundraising and obviously <laughs> ensuring we've got enough money to keep the SHDA service going and developing as we think best under the new uh, new 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 times we're living in uh, okay so, so basically I, I would end on that and, and say that the whole situation is unbelievably positive as far as the finance is concerned good thank you Nick um We've got some uh, little bits of business to do. You can the event, the accounts are available on the website, which you can have a look at. <coughs> we'll also provide hard copies on request. So, next thing is, uh, Nikki, are you going to propose the resolution yeah. for the accounts? No, I, I propose the the adoption of the accounts, which have been signed off by the auditors um, and will be 
put in on into the onto the charity commission uh, next week when I've got I'm, it now it's been done. I'm happy to second that. Uh, um, and I'll also confirm that the voting members have been given a chance to vote too, uh, and there was a majority in favour of accepting the, the accounts. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Right. So thank you very much, Nick. Just a couple of other things to tell you about the Executive Council. Uh, so the Executive Council are uh, the trustees effectively who uh, run the organization and provide advice to the chief executive and the management team. And uh, trustees have a three year term of office. We have 11 existing trustees, uh, myself, uh, Steve and Nick are standing for re-election uh, as our, our, terms of coffee, our terms of office have come to end. Uh, we've got a couple of trustees that are not re-standing. That's Christine Clark and Matt Ellison. Um, and so we'd like to say thanks very much for them. Um, and that the voting members have given them been the opportunity to vote prior to this meeting. Um, and they've accepted those uh, uh, changes in terms of the re-election. And, and so that resolution is carried. And then the final bit of business is um, that I propose that we use our auditors uh, BSC, uh, DSG's Chartered Accountants. And uh, Nick, are you happy to second that? Nick, yes, I'm there? quite sec happy to, to, um, to second okay. Thank you. They've done a very and good job. That's, that's also been um, put to the uh, voting members who've also uh, supported that. So that resolution is carried. And that, concludes, my friends, concludes the business meeting. Whew. Right. Next, um, we've got Kath, who's the, the first of our speakers, who's coming to talk to us about 50 years of the Huntington's Association. So over to you, Kath. Hi, everybody. Um, lovely to be here. I wish we were all together in the same room. Um, I really miss seeing everybody. It's the highlight of my year, uh, spending the time walking around and talking to everybody. But hopefully next year. Um, so I'm going to do a very whistle stop tour um, of the last 50 years of the association. Now you're very lucky because um, when, when Anna, my PA asked our comms team to pull together some photographs to put into this presentation, they misunderstood what she was asking them and was trying to look for 50 years, the last 50 years of photographs of me from the age of seven to 50, uh, 57. Fortunately, we realised that just in time. So that's not what you're getting today. You'd be good to know. But I was actually much uh, prettier and very much slimmer when I was seven. So I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. Yes. Like you, there's always that um, little sigh of relief when the technology works. Okay, so yeah, as I say, I'm going to do a very whistle stop tour um, and then I'm going to hand you over to Alice Wexler, who's going to talk about the history of Huntington's, but this is purely just about our charity and the charity's work. So we start in the 70s um, when it all began and it began very simply by a lady called Maureen Jones writing a letter to the people uh, who published it. Basically, Maureen had been given a diagnosis of Huntington's disease in the family and told that she was one of a handful of people in the UK. And lots of people responded to that. 76 people responded to that, in fact. Um, and that was the beginnings of the organisation. It was known as United Kingdom Committee to Combat Huntington's Disease, um, called COMBAT. Um, and I feel kind of in some ways that's still how we we some of the battles that we have on a daily basis it does feel like sometimes we are in combat but the first meeting was held in Morveen's home so if you think today uh, we had about 280 people I think registered for this uh, seminar so it shows how far we've gone since that time and the first branch formed in Sheffield and throughout the 70s the groups worked really hard just to gain support from other family members and medical professions to kind of raise the profile of Huntington's disease and again you know even today that's something that we um, do all of the time and is still at the heart of what we as a charity do. 
So when we moved to the 80s, um, we were officially registered as a charity. Um, the Scottish Huntington's Disease Association formed that evolved away from combat, although still today we work very closely with them. And I know that we've got some of our friends and partners from, from Scotland uh, here today, so welcome. And there was an organization called Friends of Combat uh, formed. And this was a group of kind of the great and the good that um, came together really just to raise the profile of Huntington's disease. And you might not recognize him, but the person with John Major in that picture is our very own Nick Heath. Um, the charity got its first computer. This, this perhaps is not of historical interest, but I find it mind boggling that actually that's not very long ago and the organization was running on one computer. It's a good job there wasn't a global pandemic then, that's all I can say. Um, we helped publish the first predictive testing guidelines and hold, held discussions groups. And I have to say, pulling together information for this, I kind of find it fascinating on, you know, 50 years isn't very long. And yet all of those kind of major milestones that have, that have passed in that time, just even the availability of predictive tests and the discussions about that. Um, and I think we're almost at that time again now when we look forward at, at the being on the crux of kind of the drugs and the, the medications and all of the work with pharma. It's just a different set of kind of ethical discussions that are taking place, but no, no less um, groundbreaking. Um, and the other thing that I didn't actually know was that the, the combaters they were then helped set up the Genetic Interest Group, which is now Genetic Alliance UK. And we still work really closely with them today. And we hosted the second European Huntington's disease conference in Warwick and there were 12 countries attended. And again, I think that shows you, you know, in, in quite a, a small period of time, um, these days at the European uh, Huntington's conferences, there's probably about, I don't know, there's hundreds of countries that attend. So from small things grow big things. So we'll move on to the 90s. Um, Princess Diana became our patron. The Huntington's gene was discovered. And I think at that point, everybody was really excited because they felt that the finding of the gene would lead to a cure or, or treatment very quickly. And we all now know that actually it's far more complicated than that. We officially became the Huntington's Disease Association and we've developed our first fact sheets creating a range of topics. The International Huntington's Association took place in Cardiff. And again, 20 countries attended now there'd be literally hundreds. Um, and the genetic interest group formed during our, using funding from ourselves. And this was the birth of our advisory service. So the case project care advice, support and education. Um, and that, that launched in this year, in, in, yeah, in this decade. And the Countess of Harwood became our patron. So the 2000s, um, the website was launched and again you know you kind of think wow that really wasn't long ago but you know imagine not having a website we had our first juvenile huntington's disease information day um, we initiated a project into the incidence and prevalence of juvenile huntington's disease and created the juvenile huntington's advisory role and and actually we were the only country and, and remain the only country in the whole of the world with a specialist juveniles Huntington's disease advisor. The first HD, JHD family weekend was held. Um, we held the World Congress in Manchester, and that's something that will always be etched on my mind. I can remember um, driving to the start of that conference, and we we decided that as an organisation. Um, because there was the, it was the World Congress, the IHA meeting was after the World Congress, but as we had all of these speakers coming over to speak at the conference that we should have our AGM that weekend. So we had three concurrent conferences back to back. Um, and as I left home to drive, my son was only quite young at the time. And he said to me, mommy, don't have a heart attack, will you? I was like, why am I likely to have a heart attack? He said, you haven't lived in this house for the last six months. So, but the World Congress was a great success, but it's not something I think we'd be jumping up and down to host a game. Um, we were winner of the NHS Health and Social Care Awards, and it was our first certificated um, Huntington's disease course for professionals. And Tony Hadley and Shane Ritchie became our patrons. So 2010s, um, we launched our Facebook and Twitter accounts. 
held our first ever young adults event. We won the AMRC, which is the Association Medical Research Council Judges Discretionary Award. We won the GSK Impact Awards. Um, we published the first prevalence study of Huntington's disease in the UK for many years. We held an APPG in Huntington's disease. And there was an audience with Pope Francis at the Vatican. We launched our Breaking Down Barriers project, which was um, work with uh, ethnic minority groups. And I know uh, Bill is there as a, as a delegate today, and Bill was very much instrumental in, in kind of leading that project. Um, and HD Voice was formed, which remains really important to this day. So a lot happening. And 2020 as well, we can't say anything without mentioning the global, global pandemic. Um, and as, as uh, Hugh mentioned, it transformed how we had to work literally overnight. This has definitely been a time of building relationships with pharmaceutical companies and, and kind of learning how to manage those relationships. And I think one of the key parts of this kind of last year has been how we can communicate bad research news, but in a positive way. I think all of us were completely and utterly devastated by the particularly the Roche trial failing. None of us saw that coming, but to be able to kind of pick ourselves up and to be able to communicate that to the community to whom it had that such a big impact. Um, that's definitely something that we've kind of learned from learning how to kind of communicate that, but still remain positive because, as you said, there is so much research happening still. Strengthening our resources, so re um, rebuilding our, the advisory service. We had, I think it was nine people retire post kind of uh, people coming back to work from being furloughed. So kind of building that all back up and developing things like our communications work. And um, the Older Carers Project was something that um, we received some funding from Bupa to do some specific work with older carers, but actually as a result of that, and I should mention uh, Ruth, who's our tech person today, who was the, the lead on that project and, and worked really, really hard. But, you know, have a look on our website. There are some amazing resources around kind of yoga and relaxation and things. Some really great resources came out of that. Um, partnership working is key you know we can't do this on our own um, working with the neurological alliance with those big neurological charities who have 10 people in their policy team or, or where you have myself and and the senior management team kind of working at it you know actually working with those to kind of look at things where we can work together is crucial as a relatively small organization the HD Quality Assured Accreditation Scheme, I'm really pleased to say that, you know, from a period of law during the pandemic, this has really taken off. So two posts that have been through accreditation are now due to be re-accredited and they're working through that process. And we have 11 more homes um, who are wanting to be accredited. So that's absolutely amazing. And I think a real success um, of this last year has been our Hashtag Family Matters campaign. Um, and this came about with some funding from Roche, where all of the UK Huntington's disease charities, so Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland came together um, and uh, produced this awareness campaign. And, and thanks to our, our, pa our patron, George, and, and to Sarah from the Scottish Association for really kind of putting themselves out there and taking uh, each media opportunity by storm and and that was really successful and thank you so much to all of the families who um in that on that website and if you haven't seen the website go and have a look at it family matters website uh telling your stories you know making huntington's come alive um and and really pour your souls out and that's what made that campaign a success so thank you so looking ahead um as Hugh said, we've got new strategy coming up. So there's a lot of work goes into that. Um, and we will be coming out to the community to kind of ask for some help and support with that and to things that are matter to you as a community. Um, the developing of the HD Quality Assured Scheme, the mapping exercise, which is um, an exercise looking at what services are out there currently for people with Huntington's disease. And, and then as a result of that, what services aren't um, and then hopefully using that information to be uh, looking at those areas where there are not services or those services are not good enough. Continue to build um, 
links with pharma. Um, one of the things that we are looking to do is actually bring in uh, an external uh, consultancy to do an impact assessment um, on our work and the value of our work and any areas that we could improve. Um, developing our policies and comms to to be able to kind of maintain all of these things and as as Hugh said you know expanding our support and resources and um, that's people on the ground the SHDA service and also the infrastructure of the charity and um, we have appointed a training lead which is really exciting and um, somebody who takes responsibility for kind of managing our training developing new training opportunities and hopefully looking towards developing some sort of um online uh, training program that people can kind of sign up and do and then we also been working with um, Surrey integrated care systems um, and they're actually looking at developing some sort of care pathway for people with Huntington's disease and um, really a stamp of good practice and when they've done that our challenge will be to really take that to other integrated care systems. So integrated care systems are kind of a new way of delivering kind of health and social care that comes into the fore in April of next year. Um, and they will, they will replace the old clinical commissioning groups. Uh, so this is a really good opportunity once this pathway is put together for us to kind of go to all of those other ICSs and say, look, this is how it can be done and why aren't you doing it this way? So that's a very exciting opportunity. Um, and now I'm going to do some little plugs. So if you haven't got a 50th birthday badge, why not go on our website and order one? Um, this year only, once they're gone, they're gone. So I encourage you to do that. And then I don't know, I, I don't know how many of you actually ordered um, our amaryllises last year. We're in working with an, a garden company called Marshalls who are an online garden company and they have produced this amaryllis especially for our 50th birthday and they were beautiful last year and um, I think I ordered everybody got one from a Christmas present for me last year and they were absolutely stunning mine flowered twice and then flowered again in the garden which is unheard of so I really encourage you if you can kind of order them buy everyone one and th they come with a little information sheet about the the association and about Huntington's disease so you're spreading awareness as well as joy um, and yes that c word Christmas will be with us soon so um, Christmas cards can be ordered on our website so please do that and just really an opportunity to say a heartfelt thank you to everybody in the community um, for your support over what has been an incredibly difficult time for you know individuals for family members for people who have had loved ones in nursing homes for people who've lost one but out of all of that you know your support to us as an organization has been so superb so thank you and here's to the next 50 years although i won't be here for all of it i doubt you never know Kat. thank you so much mm -hmm. we do have a couple of questions that that could be for me or you i think um the first question is uh, would commission service from local authorities or nhs trust be something the charity would pursue going forward uh, um, so you mean actually kind of commissioned service as in they pay us and we appoint somebody is that the question? I guess so yeah I guess so yeah yeah I mean it is definitely something that we have thought about I think it's always a difficult balance weighing up our independence so I think one of the strengths of the special advisory service is because they're not affiliated to any of those organizations when, um, I'm trying to think of a very polite way to say this, when people need kicking up the backside to do something, they can do that because they're not connected to an organization. So that's kind of one of our strengths, but it's certainly not something that we would rule out. And certainly we've had some discussions with, um, I think uh, Cambridge in particular, where that's something that's discussed. Okay. Um, here's a very specific question. When is the HG advisor being replaced for East Midlands area? That used to be Helen James. Thanks. Uh, those adverts are all out at the moment. Okay. So um, imminently. <laughs> good. Next one is, uh, this. I, I want a short answer to this question. 
the last few decades have been amazing. What have we got planned for the next five to 10 years? Well, you've said quite a lot about that already, I think, haven't you? I think, so as, in, in a nutshell, I think, you know, further developments, not stopping still, um, kind of really getting to grips with all the policy stuff is going to be important working with pharma companies, um, working with people like NICE to make sure that whatever treatment comes down the line, people can actually access, making sure that the infrastructure within the health service is there. Um, so that, you know, if it's, for example, it's an intrathecal drug, that there is actually facilities to do that. Um, in it, That's just off the top of my head. Okay. Um, right, so uh, we've got two more the quick ones. Uh, I can answer this one. Hello, I wonder where I can find more information about virtual training sessions for professionals. Well, I guess go on the website, follow HD UK. I think it is on Instagram. That's where I get it from. Every single webinar is advertised there. Um, so that's plenty of information or email directly or ring us up. There's all sorts of ways you can find out. Uh, and then the final question is, uh, Thank you for this interesting overview. Any plans to strengthen policy capacity at HTA? Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I think relative to other organisations, we, we could probably develop more in that area. Oh, sorry, I just found out one, one last question. Uh, from friends' experience, hospital staff still have little or no knowledge of HD. How can the HD remedy, HTA remedy this? I know you've tried so many times. Yeah, I think um, there are lots of different ways. So I th think that if you have somebody that you love in hospital, um, we do produce like a specific leaflet, which gives general information about Huntington's disease, but then you can write in on that leaflet specific information about your loved one. So their kind of specific needs as well as the more general stuff. I mean, that doesn't answer the training of the whole uh, hospital staff, but it certainly helps in individual circumstances. I really feel like we could spend a lot more time answering all of those questions in a lot of detail, but I am aware of the time that we're already running a little bit late. So thank you very much for your questions. And thank you very much, Kath, for your talk. See how far we've come in a, I suppose, historically speaking, quite a small um, amount of time. Next, I'm so pleased uh, to be able to introduce mm -hmm. Alice Wexler, who is a great friend of our organisation and of the Huntington's community internationally. And she's going to give a more international perspective, not just of the association, but of 50 years of uh, Huntington's disease in general. So over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh and Kath. Um, let me see if I can get at my talk up here. To be honest, after hearing uh, Kath's wonderful overview of the last 50 years of um, <laughs> the uh, of Huntington's in the UK, I feel like rewriting my entire talk. Uh, some of this is gonna be uh, familiar uh, um, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and talk um, more broadly about the history of Huntington's the last 50 years, but also a little bit about what things were like for families with Huntington's before 50 years, more than 50 years ago to highlight the changes that have happened since then. Uh, it's often said that we didn't know anything about HD before the 1960s, but actually that's not true. Huntington's Korea, as it was called, was quite well known as a family disease among neurologists, <clears throat> if not among the regular physicians in larger society by the late 1800s. And actually even earlier than that, even before George Huntington, you know, this was recognized as a family disease. Um, and by the early 20th century, it became even more well-known among neurologists and geneticists um, because of the rise of genetics as a science, but also the scientific and social movement known as eugenics. Uh, <clears throat> eugenics, of course, took different forms in different countries. But basically it was a um, social and scientific movement dedicated to what was called better breeding, meaning trying to improve society by regulating reproduction. So in, there were some countries that, the, uh, where that meant kindergartens and improved maternal care, for instance, in Brazil. But in many other countries, it meant encouraging those who were deemed the fittest to have large families while discouraging or even preventing those deemed unfit not to have children whether voluntarily or through sterilization. And the most extreme cases, of course, in Germany, 
under the Nazis in 1930s, um, actual murder. Uh, supporters of eugenics, I think it's useful to remember, included scientists, university professors, uh, university presidents and professors, um, very educated people um, who, who had accurate knowledge, in fact, about genetics and about Huntington's and considered families with Huntington's like ours among the unfit who should not have children who could inherit the disease. And um, many physicians, even very well-meaning ones, believed they were helping families by counseling those at risk not to have biological children of their own, which as you can imagine in the early 20th century or even, the, even more recently was tantamount to asking young people not to get married uh, in times and places where birth control and abortion were illegal or hard to access. And as late as the 1970s, at least in the United States, neurologists were advising those with an affected parent uh, against having children to avoid passing down the disease. So it's not surprising then that people hid the disease, not only from friends and neighbors, but also from their own family members if they could. The first big turning point then, um, as we've heard, came really in the 1960s. Um, one of the reasons was the discovery of L-DOPA in relation to Parkinson's disease inspired some neurologists to think more about Huntington's, which was often imagined as a kind of mirror image of Parkinson's. So an international group of neurologists started a research group on Huntington's Korea, as it used to be called, in 1967 to share their knowledge and try to ramp up research on, on the illness. And that, that was the same year that Woody Guthrie, the great American songwriter and singer died, which of course inspired Marjorie Guthrie, <clears throat> who was very talented and charismatic herself to start the first ever advocacy association for Huntington's. Um, in, in the United States, it was called the Committee to Combat Huntington's Disease, similar to combat or CCHD, and the emphasis was to bring together families who thought that they were the only ones to give accurate information to both families and physicians, as well as lobby for more social support and funding for research. I think it's no coincidence um, that Marjorie came out of the cultural left in the US and knew a lot about grassroots organizing that made her so effective really in helping to, to organize people to organize um, associations in other countries around the world. And also that these were the 60s, which was a decade of social activism around the world. Uh, it happened then that my own mother was diagnosed the year after Woody Guthrie, which inspired my father to join up with Marjorie uh, in her crusade to do something about HD, which then led to the Hereditary Disease Foundation, um, which focuses much more, more narrowly on recruiting and funding scientists for research. And as Kath has described uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, in the UK, uh, many countries started forming their own associations. Um, Canada formed uh, the one in 1973, one of the earliest, uh, the Netherlands in 1976, and of course the, the predecessors to the HDA in the UK. Um, I want to mention also in the 1970s, the, there, in the US, there was a congressional commission on Huntington's led by my sister, Nancy Wexler, that uh, produced a huge amount of information, not only about, this, about the United States, but about the state of Huntington's disease in other countries worldwide, that still is a valuable compendium of uh, information about HD at that moment in the mid 1970s. Of course, the next big turning point came with the discovery of the genetic marker in 1983, which narrowing the uh, territory of the Huntington's gene from the entire human genome to a small segment of chromosome four, which of course was a huge advance towards mapping the gene. And, and then that discovery of the marker made possible the beginnings of predictive genetic testing. Um, by the way, which had been a goal of the eugenicists all along, they were much more interested in predicting Huntington's than preventing it, because they thought if you could predict it, then you could advise or prevent people from having children. 
if they knew they were going to develop the disease. Predictive testing began to be offered uh, around 1986, which is the year that the HDA was formally established. Um, and uh, many of us thought, as Kath uh, I mentioned too, that after the marker was identified, the gene would be discovered soon after that, and then we would have a cure. And uh, it was much more complicated. Even to find the, um, from the marker to the gene took 10 long years for that elusive gene to show itself. Finally, in 1993, to this global team of gene hunters also led by Nancy Wexler, uh, and to reveal that it consisted of this expand, expanded CAG series of repeat sequences. Now that discovery too was a big game changer um, because it opened up all kinds of possibilities for new research approaches, animal models and cell models, um, and so that drugs and, and new molecules could be tested and the course of the disease could be studied in entirely new ways. That same year, the Huntington Study Group was begun, also a global network bringing together researchers, clinicians, patients uh, to design and conduct clinical trials. Very important um, uh, group. And of course, with the discovery of the gene itself, diagnostic and predictive genetic testing became much easier for a from a technical point of view. I think one of the most significant advances in the 1990s that followed the identification of the gene, <clears throat> in my view, was PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which did make it possible for those at risk to have children without running the risk of passing, passing on HD. And one of the big difficulties with PGD uh, is access, that it's not available everywhere, that it's very expensive in many countries, including the United States, it's not covered by insurance and it does not always work. So um, it's, while it's a big advance, it's, it's also complicated. In the last 20 years, um, so many new organizations and initiatives have sprung up uh, that uh, it's quite amazing actually addressing different aspects of Huntington's disease. So talking about all these groups is a bit like falling into alphabet soup with all the initials, but I just wanted to uh, mention um, some of them. And I'm sure some, most of these probably familiar to you. CHDI, for instance, uh, a um, nonprofit drug company had, uh, formed specifically to focus on drug discovery. And CHDI has been a major player in supporting clinical trials uh, helping to recruit HD family members for Enroll, which is a global um, HD registry. Then the year after that, 2003, the European Huntington's Association was organized, EuroHD, to focus more specifically on Europe. And then uh, three more groups that I think um, are quite brilliant. Um, two of them started in the UK. HD Buzz, which uh, Kath mentioned, begun in 2011 um, by Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll, that offers scientific information about research in non-jargony, straightforward and beautiful language, I think is a, actually a huge boon and a gift to all of us in the HD community. HDYO, another one, um, started also in the UK by Matt Ellison, 2012 uh, to focus specifically on young people and has created has developed all kinds of creative initiatives to connect and inform young people in multiple languages too around the world, which I think is incredibly valuable. And then Ding Ding Dong is a group based in Paris and Brussels, a very unusual group that uses Huntington's as an inspiration really to think in new ways about living with disability and imagining new ways of being in the world through all kinds of uh, creative initiatives, including theater pieces, dance performances, video and film and books. So there's really um, an incredible number of new resources available for the HD community, uh, which is one of the great accomplishments of the last 50 years of Huntington's disease. So just to conclude, what have we learned? What has been accomplished? I think, um, 
clearly, while Huntington's is still an incurable disease, it's not untreatable. Um, there are many uh, medications available that can help with the symptoms. We know so much more about lifestyle strategies. And um, we've seen the advance into clinical trials of an array of disease altering therapies. Um, secondly, something that I, I really like to emphasize is how important social connections are to living with Huntington's for those living with the disease and for um, loved ones and carers. And I think that's what part of what the, um, the HDA has been so brilliant at, at uh, doing and um, helping to foster these social connections, which are just uh, incredibly um, important. I think historically isolation, loneliness, has been a big problem with Huntington's disease because of shame and stigma and the difficulty of, that psychiatric illnesses can pose. But the associations themselves and organizations like HDA, HDYO <clears throat> have made major contributions and provided the resources, the, the networks and the information to help combat that isolation and loneliness that, to, that in my way of thinking is one of the most painful parts of this illness. And we have a much better idea today of how to address stigma and um, the importance of being open and honest about Huntington's whenever possible, acknowledging that in some circumstances and in some places, it's not always possible. I wanna emphasize fourth that uh, while Huntington's we know affects both males and females, the social impact of the disease can differ according to gender because the larger society treats males and females differently. And one thing that probably has not changed all that much is that girls and women still bear more of the brunt of caregiving for family members. And we've seen that in the pandemic, uh, that women um, have been impacted more severely than men simply because they're likely to bear more responsibility for the children um, and more responsibility for ailing relatives. So this is not a Huntington specific problem, but it's a problem that Huntington's families experience. Access to good quality care remains uh, an enormous problem in many places. Uh, it, it is a crucial problem in the United States um, where the care facilities are mostly inadequate, which was very, dramatized very much during the worst times of the pandemic. Finally, um, I'd like to repeat a truism that we've learned, especially from the disappointment of the halting of the Roche trial. Uh, we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. And here I mean not only to place, not to place all of our hopes on one drug, but not to place all of our hopes on science and medicine because of the fact that, that part of the suffering associated with it comes from the social circumstances and lack of a supportive environment and loneliness that too often accompanies Huntington's disease. And science and medicine are super important as the vaccine has shown in our current pandemic. Uh, I think participating in research is crucial to our progress going forward. Um, but just as social inequities and the lack of education, misinformation, lack of essential services have made the COVID pandemic much worse than it needed to be, so too, I think, with Huntington's, um, and again, this varies uh, in different countries around the world, poverty, lack of education, misinformation, lack of essential support service, and especially the care facilities, adds to the challenge of the disease itself. So that's why I'm so grateful for organizations like the HDA that are doing tremendous work, creating resources for those of us who are living with Huntington's in our families, uh, because I think you are helping to change the landscape and the circumstances for all of us associated with the disease. So as a historian, you are changing history and I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alice. That's a lovely perspective. Um, and it's amazing to see how far we've come in all this time, how far there is to go. I have a little question for you. How would you imagine uh, Huntington's will look, I don't know, let's say 20 years from now? I won't say 50, but let's say 20 years from now, in your mind, how would you imagine the, the field will look then? <laughs> that is a very tough question. Uh, 
you know, I don't actually have an, a, a, a picture of Huntington's, but my hope is that what we're learning from these clinical trials with gene therapy, what I actually hope for is, is a drug that will be simple to take, that will be available, uh, that um, will intervene in the disease and will slow it down, uh, will delay it. Um, and, you know, the ideal would be to prevent it. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one question um, in the chat that says, uh, do we know if all, any organizations send medical equipment to third world countries? I'm not quite sure what medical equipment might be in this setting, but. Factor H do. Factor oh. H support third world countries. Okay, yeah. Um, Kath or Alice, do you want to just say a, a couple of words on Factor H so if people don't know about that? Um, I, I didn't hear. I didn't hear the Factor question. H. Do you know about? Oh yes. Oh, I, that's that was a big omission of mine. Yes, Factor H is doing incredibly important work in Latin America, uh, so with a focus on Colombia, but um, in other countries too. Uh, yeah, helping to to um, provide some resources you know, both material and clinical to um, the poor communities where there, where there are clusters of Huntington's disease. So they're doing extremely um, creative and valuable work and also helping to train locals to, um, to, to help with Huntington's as well. So if, if uh, people on this uh, meeting wanted to get involved in that, presumably have Factor H have a website or a web presence that you can find I think there's yes. a guy, Nacho, is it, that runs the organization? Right. So it's they very, very easy to find. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, you're welcome, of course, to stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, but it's really nice to see you and hear from you. And hopefully Likewise. it will be nice to meet in person before too long, I hope. Yes. yes. Welcome back, everybody, from the comfort break and the discussion of various Zoom backgrounds. Uh, uh, then the moderator just said, please put any questions that you have for Jimmy into the chat and we'll try and put them to Jimmy in time. Right, it's such a pleasure to introduce uh, Jimmy Pollard to you. Now, Jimmy may remember better than I, he came to speak in Birmingham very many years ago, I'm gonna say maybe 25 years ago. And at the time he described, I think he's the person, he's one person who he doesn't have Huntington's disease, but he can describe what it might feel like to be a person with Huntington's disease more accurately than anyone else I know who doesn't happen to have Huntington's disease. And when he described the experiences that he had, I was, because I'm always fascinated by what it is to be another person, you know, and when he described that, that really hooked me into HD. So Jimmy, it's your, you're sort of responsible for that. Uh, all those years ago, that talk you gave in the Postgraduate Centre in Birmingham, I went, wow, that is the most amazing thing. I just want to do that forever. And here we are 25 years later. Well, and so thank you for those words. Uh, I'm very touched by that. Uh, and just I, I don't want to take up time because I know we're running behind. But let me tell you my memory of that meeting. Uh, we were in a brand new multi million pound facility, media facility, if you recall. And I asked the woman who was the tech person if she had an overhead projector because I was still using transparencies. And she was just absolutely insulted that I would ask for an overhead projector uh, in that multi-million dollar facility. And she thought I was just one of those Americans kind of thing. Uh -huh. So anyway, thank you for the kind words. Um, shall I commence? Please commence, yes. So it, obviously in 1967, uh, when it all began, I mean, Marjorie Guthrie places a classified ad, or I'm, I'm not sure what you call them in the UK, but one of those little line ads in the paper saying, if you know about Huntington's disease, call this number, her, her number. And, and then, you know, Alice's uh, dad uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, then learn just now that Marvin Jones had the first meeting in her home and 50 years of this fantastic association. Congratulations to all, as Alice was saying, 
one and all for contributions, small and large. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity, especially on the 50th anniversary of the HDA. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak about care. Uh, and I'll talk in a second about what I mean by care. And because it's a crowded field these days, which is the good news among, there are so many topics. So my definition of care is, uh, or how I use the word is that it's, it's a moment or several moments that obviously uh, accumulate into weeks and months and years in, in HD's case, for some folks, decades. And it's that moment when the person who's actually walking their HD road with a loved one or whatever, interacts, engages in some kind of activity, converses, they're helped or people help them and they struggle, folks with HD struggle to be understood in the, that care partner uh, struggles to understand them. Th that's those kind of moments. And the old saying used to be Huntington's disease happens in the home. And I think that's true. So these, these the moments I talk about are the things that happen in kitchens, in your bathrooms, in your dining rooms, in your living rooms. Um, just you and your loved one, you, you with your loved one, and you could either be the person with HD or the person who is uh, walk, taking space, as they say, with them and, and serving the role of caregiver. Um, and within the scope of that, I, I mean things where you might be helping somebody to eat or, or bathe or dress, uh, transferring them from chair to toilet to bed, um, lifting and, and positioning people and pushing wheelchairs. And when I think of pushing wheelchairs, I smile because, oh my God, if, you, if we took collectively just the number of people that are listening to me for all the miles they pushed wheelchairs, it is, it's uh, just amazing. Um, you've heard the term, burden of care and therein lies much of the burden that physical stuff if you look at the 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 clinical triad of symptoms of of uh uh movement and and physical symptoms and uh mood and cognitive stuff uh the, so much of the burden of care is within that that heavy stuff um um and that's not to uh let's not also forget uh that uh, beyond those physical kind of things, they're the burdens of, of worry and concern as the psychiatric manifestations, those who have them of HD, particularly um, depression and all the worry that brings people struggle with it. I talk about uh, care and once uh, in Wales, maybe at a, uh, at a, a care home, meeting with Dai Lies once, um, a woman came up to me and said, what you're talking about is caring or care at the coal face. So then she described to me not knowing much about Welsh mining, uh, about that and what caring at the coal face meant in her assessment of it. And that stayed with me over the years. And I think her description of caring at the coal face is what I'm really talking about. Um, but within that general context, um, there's also uh, the, those cognitive challenges in, in that clinical triad of, of movement and mood and cognitive features. Um, the, the challenges of, of people expressing themselves and, and trying for uh, those who love them to understand them, um, just so that you can maintain the warmth and, and closeness and, and so much more of your relationship, uh, trying to understand one another just so that you can uh, maintain running your household, um, the efficiency of multiple people, especially if there's kids in the home, of just the efficiency of living together. Those are the cognitive things and the person who's walking their HD road, the person who's living with HD, I mean, those kind of things they experience those things that I had described to you earlier uh, back uh, in Birmingham, uh, uh, you just some of the things I go through are just that slower processing of everything, of information, of everything that's coming in. And then 
just collecting or organizing their thoughts. The difficulty of planning simple things that we previously would take for granted or just holding on to a thought, even in a calm environment where there are still multiple uh, distractions. And those folks who, for neural reasons, when they want something, they want it now. The, that's, those are the challenges, a short list of many, that, uh, of many challenges, deficits that people living with HD face. And as you know, the list is much longer than that. But at any moment, they're facing those and they're facing several of those features simultaneously at any moment. The carer, on the other hand, since you can't fix, well, actually, we'll see if you can fix them. And I would say, since you can't fix them yet with all the hope of science, uh, you can't fix them. So the carer, the loved one who is caring folks, they've got to simply accommodate them. And this accommodation of those cognitive challenges the loved ones live with, I just refer to it as cognitive care. Yes, like the physical demands of care, it is draining. And in many ways, it's way more difficult than some of those more physical things. If you look at some of the simple accommodations and in this talk, as I often have, by the way, I'm gonna just talk about four of them. Uh, going slower, uh, waiting one thing at a time and hurrying up and we'll explain that in a minute. But the accommodations, those four words I said are very simple words. Everybody understands them. You've got to go a bit slower to accommodate their slower processing. You have to wait often because that slower processing contributes to pauses and delays maybe in responding to simple questions, for example. So slower, wait, one thing at a time, helping people keep focus among those distractions one thing at a time and hurry up because for neural reasons, when they want something, folks often, not everybody and not always, but when they want something, they want it now. <clears throat> so if you can, within reason, you should hurry up and help them and provide whatever you can at any time quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, I don't want to lose sight that while uh, you are uh, uh, making those accommodations, right next to you is that person who is still simultaneously facing those challenges. So when we talk about the burden of care, cognitive care is a substantial part of it. And I think people understand that. Um, uh, just as we speak, though, of the burden of care, within it is our moments of joy. For you as the carer and for the person walking their road. And experienced caregivers, some of the multi, many, more than one generation, will, will verify this. There are moments of joy. Uh, they may be fleeting. They may be few, they may, may be far between, they may be relatively small, but they're there nonetheless. And my point is that most often those, and, and examples of, let me just give a couple of examples of what a joyful moment might be. It might be simply solving a problem when you can't figure out communicating uh, and you finally figure out something, that could be a moment of joy. Under, simply understanding somebody and somebody's answer to your question through through slurred dysarthric speech or 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 slower processing, M maybe a joyful moment is being able to see through all the disability and all of the disguise that HD places on your loved one to reveal the that essential person that you love. Um, those are all kinds of, uh, or maybe just simply being able to take somebody out on a holiday or, 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 a, di or a single day out. Um, those things, uh, most often, those moments of joy, again, if you look at the clinical triad of movement and mood and cognitive challenges, 
most often, in my humble opinion, I've observed happen when carer and loved one meet uh, and uh, in, you know, that accommodating those cognitive challenges. So that's where the, the joy is found. And it's one of the reasons I've been harping on this for, as HDA knows, for years now. But I want to let you know that, or verify for you, or confirm that cognitive care, doing those simple accommodations is very, very difficult, really. For some more than others, some folks it comes naturally to. Most of it really doesn't, and it's really difficult. Just simply consider the four that I've already named, like don't put HD aside for a minute. Anywhere in your life, when somebody blows in and, and says, hey, man, slower, slow down, slow down. It's like, really? Do you live in the same world I do? Or they say, just wait, just wait. And you say, what? Like, I've got the time? Or somebody says, hey, just one thing at a time, reassuring one thing at a time. And sometimes people's instant visceral reaction is, man, we live in a multitasking world. Come on, one thing at a time. What are you, crazy? And if you don't think we multitask, how many times, oops, have you uh, uh, been uh, doing something of import and you're also on your cell phone and social media or whatever? We live in multitasking cultures. And then somebody has the nerve to come in and tell you to hurry up, what? And drop what I'm doing? These things are hard, hard to do. Let's just take two of them I've named. Let's take the hurry up and the wait. Some of you heard me talk about this particular point before, but I wanna talk about it again. I think it's that essential. So take the, uh, the wait. Now, we will talk about it in a minute in a little bit more detail. We want you to wait so people have time to respond in your discussions with them, your conversations. Again, simply the mundane conversations at your kitchen tables. So we want you to wait for that. But at the same time, that for neural reasons, people may have difficulty waiting themselves. We want you to, within reason, underline within reason, hurry up and provide them or, or get to them as soon as you can. So if you're the carer, you say, wait a minute, you want me to hurry up because for no reasons he can't wait, but you want me to wait to accommodate his slower processing and the pauses and the delays. Are you telling me you want me to hurry up and wait? Hurry up and wait, is, that's crazy. And that phrase represents the craziest craziness of all kinds of human systems. And you want me to do them both at the same time. And the answer to that is yes. Now, uh, allow me to share my screen. S ask this question. What might it feel like to do hurry up and wait moment to moment Day after day, week after week, month after month, as again, I said, maybe in, for decades, what might it feel like to do this hurry up and wait, providing this cognitive care? Ah, some of you have may seen the, this before. I think this illustration, this old illustration uh, uh, conveys that kind of frustration and ah, pull, having pulled your hair out. But it's a partnership. So what does it feel like for the person with Huntington's disease? If you have HD, it might feel like ah, the same thing. What a challenging partnership. Now, that's why uh, over the years in my travels around your country, whether it's Burnley, Chester, Telford, Preston, Liverpool, Walls End, Grantham, Rotherham, Keswick, Wigan, Mole, Barrow, London, or in the Caliber Trust, I've said, and we'll use this opportunity to say it again, providing cognitive care and doing that hurry up and wait 
is a profound act of love. That's why the heart in this logo I use, and I will pause for effect. Doing this, whether you have HD or whether you are the carer, is a profound act of love. Now, let me unshare here. When you tell people about cognitive care, if you will, making those simple accommodations and just a few of them, <laughs> there are two reactions. And the first one is um, uh, they, people will say, geez, this was right in front of me. I should have known this. It's simple. I, it's, it's too, I wish I had known this. I wish I had known it for my wife, but maybe, but now I can use it for my son. So those, that's one set of reactions collectively that people have. The other one, though, is ah, these things are simple, Jimmy, but they are really, really hard to do. And to that, I say, of course they are. <clears throat> and I just want to take a minute to let you know that they've been hard, this notion of having to do something quickly and then slowing down, slow. This has been around for generations. No, it's been around for millennia. Outside of the context of HD, but nonetheless, if you wonder why it is so challenging, let me share my screen again. Let's go back to uh, 350 years before Christ. You do is grab a Bible and look at Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 9.11. The race is not to the swift. Or moving forward 500 years, 500 BC, we have this guy who you will recognize the bust of this gentleman, but you will recognize his name. And it, that is Aesop of Aesop's Fables fame and who gave us the tortoise and the hare. And slow but steady wins the race against expectations. Then even later in the 1400s in the Renaissance after Gutenberg uh, invents the printing press, uh, we have uh, printers, uh, very uh, important, prestigious uh, thing back then. And they had printer's marks. You can think of them as logos these days, but here's one. And you'll notice that it kind of shows that apparent contradiction of having to do something fast, hurry, and wait slow, and there is a tortoise with a sail on his back, and the Latin phrase up top, festinolente, which means, translates to make haste slowly. And, and here's another one from a printer named Aldous, and they use the, the uh, symbol of an anchor with a dolphin. Um, the point is, even in ancient history, people have struggled with, at the same time, having to uh, uh, do something quickly, hurry, and slow wait. So it's not you if you find it difficult. It is really hard. Neurologically, we, every human, we don't come hardwired to slow down and wait and do or hurry up under with all other things going. We don't come hardwired for that. So yes, if you feel overwhelmed or challenged or your wits end or uh, trying to accommodate these things, again, it's not you. So I, uh, as Hugh had mentioned, don't, my family is not directly touched by HD. I come this from this as uh, uh, somebody who worked in a care home. <clears throat> in, in 1986, June 1986, I met my first person with Huntington's disease who came to live in our nursing home. And three years later, um, we had 55 people with Huntington's who were calling our nursing home home. And we knew nothing about Huntington's disease. We experienced in that home, the collective staff and management, um, never mind the people who came to live there. Uh, we experienced growing pains. We, we integrated relatively young folks walking their HD road as residents into this formerly geriatric care setting. Um, and this group, God bless them. God bless you all. 
were not still quiet and docile. Like many of the geriatric residents, I will point out, I speak now having had my 70th birthday as a, as a geriatric, but they were new and their relative youth was a challenge. Nurses, for example, weren't accustomed to uh, uh, when they would pass med medications to a young person saying, nah, I don't want to do that right now. I'll get back to you later kind of thing. It was like, ah, or the rehab staff, uh, they didn't want to go to the rehab room and, and these things became so minor in retrospect, but were challenges at the time. And, and, and the regulations of the nursing home uh, by our regulatory authorities pay much attention to safety. And here we were trying to ask people to wear helmets and use walkers when they, they wanted no part of them. Th these things really tested us. But as crazy as it got, we listened to families. And I want to actually give you quick three instances of listening to families. Because I think sometimes many, many of my colleagues and you families, you folks who are family will have heard my colleagues and I saying, we learned from you. And that is accurate. It's not just something nice we're saying for, with gratitude. It's literally true. So here are three. Um, one is to just to put some meat on that and let you know that that's real. And I think it's important in the context of 50 years of this association because it is a partnership between families and professionals, not only medical and uh, care people, but allied health professionals like rehab or nursing home folks uh, like me, that that partnership is strong, but it, part of it is families teaching professionals. The, the three, three quick examples, um, uh, there was a woman, a woman named Phyllis, who uh, uh, her husband came to live with us, and he was hunkered down in his room. He didn't want to leave, and we felt we, as as staff, compelled to get him out of his room and get involved. And uh, <coughs> when he wanted something, we weren't timely in our response, and then he would get very angry. And finally, and we struggled with this, and then. Phyllis said, why don't I just bring in his easy chair from home and put him in his room? And I mean, he hasn't done anything but watch TV at home with me for the last three years. And then I've learned when you want something, you got to do it quickly. We brought the thing in. We started with chair and we started to respond quickly. And our issues went away <laughs> because of what Phyllis had said. She solved the problem. And actually, and her husband came out of his room uh, not over time. Next one is a, a woman named, named Barbara. And as, as middle management at the time, Barbara was speaking with her daughter about whether or not to get a feeding tube. So a discussion of some import, and, and I had to be there as representing management. And the, in the feeding tube discussion, I would keep asking, her daughter questions. And I remember Barbara gently, uh, as I fired another question at her daughter, just gently putting her hand on my forearm and pushing it back and just signaling to me, just give her a moment to respond. Um, and she did. And a, a, a third one, a woman named Lorena, who basically did the same thing uh, when I was firing questions at her daughter, um, who basically shushed me. Now, I know a lot of people are like, don't shush me. I didn't react that way, but she shushed me. She just went. And sure enough, her daughter would slowly, but would respond and everything was fine. So my point is that in terms, especially of cognitive care, we learn from families. I've learned from families and folks who are walking their roads. Two points on this. Um, well, one of them I've already made, actually, which is when people, professionals tell you 
that they've learned from you, believe it. They mean it literally. And as family, you should celebrate that because you've put somebody straight. And the, the another point is, um, I know that families often in some scenarios, at some times, at some places in the healthcare system, both yours, certainly, certainly in the United States, um, people will be very frustrated because they've got to explain HD to somebody that should know it. And I understand, I understand how frustrating that can be. It, even with all the wonderful services you guys have and we even have here in the US, that still happens. I know it's frustrating. I know it's, I understand it. But again, as somebody who's learned from families, I look at it differently. And I say, as frustrating as it is, who better than you to, to teach us? So again, that's been a major theme of 50 years. But don't always get over the frustration and kind of just celebrate with a knowing smile that you taught someone else. And the third and probably the most uh, important point is that those family members taught me that those accommodations worked. <clears throat> now, because of the way science and the social research in the social service world happens, there's not a lot of research or any in, in the homes of what strategies to use. Uh, I bemoan that. But uh, what I've learned is they taught me is that these things work, maybe not immediately, and maybe for some more than others, some not at all. But in that nursing home, with that rapid uh, entry of folks coming to live with us, walking their HD road, over time, it changed the entire culture of that home. It changed the entire experience for those residents with HD walking their HD road. It changed the experience of walking their HD road and changed the nature of the work that the carers did. And at the time, one of the, when I was management, um, it certainly contributed to the efficiency of the daily operation of the home, which I was grateful for as a manager. Um, interestingly enough, these care principles were helpful, not just to residents with HD, but to other residents who had other neuro, care, neuro issues and those geriatric residents who were there long before the younger folk came. Um, because essentially, these things are above all, do no harm kind of principles. Where I'm going with this is that then, as we were taught this, now we've got to pass it on. The turnover in American nursing homes among frontline staff, those who actually would accommodate those cognitive challenges, certified nursing assistants, we call them here. Um, um, what do we teach them? What do we train them in? And uh, uh, 30 years ago, there was still a lot to teach folks about HD, but the way reimbursement in the United States works is there's too little time uh, to take uh, frontline staff off the unit and, and teach them. So it's a challenge to constantly whittle down everything you want to teach them down to the essentials. Now, I'm a teacher by background, so I think of it as, as curriculum or uh, the phrase curating the curriculum uh, comes to mind. You can't teach them everything, but you certainly want to teach them the most important stuff, the most essential stuff. Uh, now in 2021, that challenge is even greater uh, because there is so much more known. Um, the field that we've come so far, but the field of topics in the, the HD world to talk about is broad. And that, as Kath had shown in her historical uh, uh, cook's tour, uh, there's so much to teach and train and talk about within the community. We've come so far, but that challenge of whittling down the essential stuff is getting difficult. It's getting crowded here when you talk about this caring at the coal face kind of thing. I mean, 50 years ago, uh, though some of you recall how little information there was, 
And you'll hear people talk about having gone to nursing manuals or uh, medical dictionaries. Um, and you find a brief paragraph, which had about HD, it was there, but there was little utility for if you were caring for somebody at home. Um, people will talk about, they went to the public library to look up stuff and not even finding much there. <clears throat> it's no wonder, uh, uh, looking in this broad stroke of history, it's no wonder people uh, began to organize. Uh, topics that weren't discussed then obviously kind of going through some of Alice's list and Kath's history were testing to test and not to test and all of the things that interesting, compelling topics to discuss and teach uh, along, along that or, or even the drugs we have now, the symptomatic drugs. Um, and then there's been a growth of uh, constituencies within the family constellation, the extended family, that provide new things to discuss, new topics. I mean, for many of those 50 years, we didn't have topics aimed at pre-symptomatic or prodromal people, folks living with in that state. Um, we, pay, we didn't have the due attention, uh, although you guys were way, way, way pioneering ahead of the curve, uh, attention given to juvenile onset HD. Uh, or, or as uh, uh, Alice pointed out as a milestone, youth, young people. I mean, I'm, you know, there was this kid who used to sit in the back of the room on a laptop. I think his name was Matt, who has kind of fostered and launched a whole set new set of topics of honey disease and youth. Uh, and then the, talking to kids about HD and all the way to yoga and cannabis it's getting, and the very nature of HD is interesting to the general public. Um, and, and add to the, add the in incremental uh, successes and setbacks of science. The growth of compelling topics within the HD world is just to be celebrated, but care at the coal face, it, among the topics, it's getting crowded out there. That's why I wanted to use this opportunity uh, to talk about this. Again, it's great. Um, it's great that we have this problem. It's a problem you want to have. Within the community, though, there's, there's, there's a bandwidth um, with those topics that we couldn't see 50, for, could not have foreseen 50 years ago. And admittedly, some topics are for a limited audience uh, within the family, uh, the extended family, and some are more general. Um, science, and they will continue because science grows, important topics expand, but care remains. And it's important to keep focus on that essential care, that coal face care. And it, it's essential uh, because it can, it can affect the experience of living with HD, and it can affect what it's like looking ahead to living with HD, and it can affect the experience of carers. And in some cases, hopefully, um, it can lighten the load of one's HD road, maybe take some bumps out of the road, fill in some potholes, straighten a curve or two. And this kind of cognitive care, the basics that I'm talking about, it's really, uh, a cumulative coal face acquired collective uh, wisdom or strategies that are passed on. And I wanna keep passing them on. Um, so to better squeeze in uh, these cognitive accommodations, cognitive care into this crowded field, I've uh, kept whittling down and getting to the essentials, the curriculum, and have begun to think of it as universal accommodations for cognitive challenges. Those slower, wait, one thing, hurry. Let me share my screen at this point. Um, there we go. And there you will recall, uh, there is universal precautions for bloodborne pathogens. We first saw them as the general public that existed forever, but the, in, in the AIDS epidemic, and they still live on in, in medical offices settings. But that presentation of the simple stuff 
with icons. And now more recently, we see them uh, with COVID and icons for social different distancing, uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, sanitize, that kind of stuff. So I've kind of, and this, this representation needs some graphic design work and it's, it would be welcome if anybody wants to take it on. But here's how I've begun to whittle it down in this crowded field and present it as universal accommodations for those thinking challenges. Again, slower, wait one at a time and hurry up. Here it is for children. Teaching our young kids, I'm finding in, in families is really important. Here's Kira's tips. We'll get to Kira in a second. Um, uh, and I, a child's uh, representation of that. So I've also, because of uh, trying to whittle it down and keep to that, I've also tried to keep it alive by trying to teach, get to help families teach their littlest kids, kids three to five, let's say, about these cognitive accommodations. So I wrote a children's storybook. I enlisted my elementary school art teacher, son Patrick, who illustrated, he did these illustrations of Kira. <clears throat> um, and uh, so it's a children's picture, picture storybook. And again, uh, I just wanna show it to you because it's a tool using these same coalface principles for kids. It's called Finding Nana's Smile. Just wanna read you three or four, be quick, uh, pages. So Kira is there, her Nana has processing delays, pauses in conversation, uh, and kind of a mask from the physical symptoms, uh, movement-related symptoms of, of HD in this case. But anyway, Kira figures Nana doesn't love her. She thinks Nana's mad at her because when Kira hugs Nana, she doesn't squeeze back. And when she says hi, she doesn't say hi or smile quickly. So there's a page where Papa reassures her, oh, Nana, oh, Nana loves you. She hugs you. She loves you. She always hugs back. He explained, no, Papa, Kira said again, Nana doesn't hug me back. Are you waiting long enough, he asked. She was confused. What do you mean, Papa? Nana hugs late, so you've got to wait. It takes her longer. Do you mean if I waited longer, Nana would hug me too? Yes, Papa explained. She does things late, so we have to wait. Okay, Papa. She thought about it as she ran to play with her cousins, where she encounters a cousin named Josh, who then asks Nana. Then Josh asks Nana, can I have a cookie too? Nana looked at Josh. He asked again, Nana, can I have a cookie, please? Nana stared at Josh. Kira watched them both. Nana sat still. Disappointed, Josh walked away. He wanted a cookie too. Now it's Kira's turn. Can I please have one, asked Kira. Nana looked at Kira, but didn't move. Kira watched her. She wondered whether Nana would give her a cookie. She waited another moment. Nana took a cookie off the plate and handed it to her. Thanks, Nana. Papa was right. She ran to find Josh, where Josh sees her with the cookie and says, Nana gave you a cookie? Why you and not me? He asked. Nana does things like Josh. Papa told me. It takes her longer to do things, so we have to wait. Even for cookie? Yes, for everything. I tried it when I asked her for mine. I thought she was mad at me. She's not? No. We just have to wait longer. So that's finding Nana's smile, taking those basic core cognitive care accommodations and trying to teach them to our littlest kids. Um, and at that point, I would ask, so another uh, request in the context of this cognitive care thing is, let me unshare my screen. So anyway, uh, uh, finding Nana's smile, You'll note or know that um, it doesn't mention Huntington's. Actually, it doesn't mention any disease. It's just that Nana smiles late, so we have to wait. She just does things differently. Again, 
it's my attempt to just whittle the things down and teach it to an important population, the youngest kids among us, long before risk factors and stuff enter, three to five roughly. So in closing, I wanna address two things. Um, first is aimed at folks who are at risk or pre-symptomatic. Now, admittedly, this is a lot to ask. And I thought about whether I should talk about this. So yes, it's a lot to ask. And it's that those folks, as they encounter their first symptoms, write about what it's like viscerally in their head, if you will, to experience those cognitive challenges. Especially if you think of a plane ride when they say turbulence ahead, which people know in this metaphor, but when those first jolts in the, in the uh, plane happen, um, similarly, what the experience of that is like. I know that this, uh, and the reason I ask is, for those of us who are carers, particularly in the domain of trying to provide cognitive care, understanding that experience, I have found to be helpful so that we can better accommodate your challenges and become better care partners. Now, I know I'm aware it's not easy, and I'm aware that these things are private. They're private in a couple of senses. First of all, they're yours. There's nothing more intimate than your thoughts uh, uh, that we can't see and remain unshared. <coughs> so they're private, excuse me. They're private in that sense, but they're also private in the sense that we can't see them. We can't know them unless you describe them. I also know that it's also hard, um, hard to uh, articulate them sometimes, especially if you experience them and then that time passes and they're over to actually look back and try to articulate them in writing or whatever. It's really hard. Uh, but I know that I've learned from some descriptions like that for me, and it's really helped me personally. And I think that they can help your care partners. Um, so let me just give you an example quickly here. This is from a friend of mine, Amy, who's a teacher, and she wrote this once about her first, some of her er earliest cognitive, the experience of those cognitive symptoms. I started to notice something, this freezing of my thoughts pops up at inopportune times during some of my classes. I can best describe it as feeling like cling wrap. Now, in case we have a difference in the UK in the United States, cling wrap is that, that film that comes in a roll that you pull out and cover food or containers that you might refrigerate with, cling wrap. We, uh, the big brand name here in the US is saran wrap, if you have that in the UK, but I can best describe it as feeling like cling wrap covers my thoughts for a few seconds. My thoughts are there and I'm very much aware of them, but they're wrapped tightly, they, they freeze. But I know they're there and there isn't anything I can do about it. When it happens, there aren't any emotions attached to it. It's just that my thought is stuck. I'm not frightened, irritated, sad, nothing. It's very different than forgetting a thought such as, I can't believe I can't remember the name of that movie, or where did I put my keys? Those forgetful thoughts I've always experienced from time to time, we all do, when we're wondering what the hell is the name of that movie? We feel both frustrated trying to remember it and excited at the same time to resolve the mystery. But when the cling wrap symptom occurs, I'm simply observing in my mind that a thought is there and it's not moving. This always lasts only a few seconds, maybe five. And when my thought becomes unwrapped, my brain realizes it's functioning as usual again, emotion happens. I'd say the number one emotion I feel after my thoughts flow, flow again is gratitude and curiosity. It's always later though, usually alone in my own quiet time that I start to feel overwhelmed with the fears that facing HD can offer. So that's what I mean. And I think I know it's helped me, but for all the writing people do, 
about their challenges in social media and books and, and all kinds of formats. To focus on those things, I think, would be real helpful. The second request, as I end here, is of everybody in the extended family. If you look at how many times you describe HD to people in your life, neighbors, friends, coworkers, parents of your kids' friends, it's thousands, tens of thousands of times in your life. And I would ask that you begin to think carefully about what you put in those descriptions and try to take some of these accommodations or the challenges that require them and put them into your nutshell descriptions. Example, now I'm not telling you how to do this or putting words in your mouth, that's yours and that you have the power of telling your story within it. But maybe you, if you say my dad is HD, it's a genetic brain disease, rather you wanna put something in like my dad is HD, it takes him a little bit longer to respond, to answer questions. He's a bit slower organizing his thoughts, but he still enjoys seeing you or whatever. So in those quick things, try to do that. I've always thought we need better way to describe HD to people and, and, and maybe edit in your auto description, if you will, that thing that just flows through your mouth. It is a wonderful opportunity, not only to subtly teach these fund, fundamental care accommodations, but to put something even better in the description to the general public. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jimmy. You're still slaying it after all these years, my friend. <laughs> You're still telling me things I didn't know. It's still making me think that I've got, I'm going to go away and think about cling film. It's called cling film. And anyway. I'm going to think about cling film thoughts just, yeah, forever. And doing it with love, through the lens of love. Uh, and then our last speaker today is Ed Wild. All righty. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. When I say here, I mean, uh, I wish I wasn't here, but I wish we were all in a room together. But Hugh and I were in the same room yesterday and it's the first time that we've seen each other for probably two years because um, it was the UK HD network and we had this hybrid format meeting um, and um, I feel like we're very close to being able to do that. In fact, I got the train up to Birmingham, which is what I used to do when I was on the way to Telford for the HDA AGM year upon year. Um, and I, I never thought I'd say this, but I, I almost wish that I was in Telford yesterday. <laughs> I'm very fond of Telford. Um, anyway, um, so we're, we're making progress, we're heading in the right direction, um, but, you know, we're not quite there yet. And again, that could easily be a slogan for uh, HD research. We're making progress, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so we, those eagle-eyed among you who are, uh, who are both fans of Lord of the Rings and um, saw my talk last year will recognise that uh, there was a Lord of the Rings theme to the talk that I gave at the AGM um, last year. In fact, I started with this image of Lady Galadriel. And the theme of that talk was that, the, you know, um, the pandemic was making everything really difficult and rubbish. Um, but science was a light to bring us hope in the dark times of the pandemic. And then, you know, normally I would use a different theme for the next year. But unfortunately, um, everything just got worse. Uh, after my talk, we had the second massive wave of COVID cases and deaths. And then um, in March, uh, things started to go specifically wrong for all of the things that we had been hoping for uh, in Huntington's disease. So I'm, I'm, I'm keeping Lady Galadriel and Lord of the Rings because, um, you know, more than ever, we need a, this light in dark times. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a very tough year. In fact, it does remind me of that moment in the in the story where Gandalf is, is dragged off into a chasm by a Balrog and, uh, well, you know, seems to have died. Uh, I don't want to do any spoilers, but um, anyway, later on, they all meet Lady Galadriel, and she says, the quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Strave us a little, and it will fail to the ruin of all. And it, and it sort of, at times, it, I feel much better now, but at times earlier in the year, in kind of March, April, May, I felt really, you know, I really did feel a little bit like uh, as despondent as the hobbits when they, when they arrive in... Um, um, it's not Rivendell, it's the other one. Anyway, when they meet her. And of course, this is the thing, uh, this is the thing that, um, that kind of uh, happened in March and really kind of stopped everyone in their tracks. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess 
by now most people are familiar with with the idea of Huntington lowering and this drug Tominersen. Um, but uh, you know, and, and every time I've given a talk about the things I've been excited about in the past 15 years, it's been the idea of a drug to stop the brain producing a harmful protein, mutant Huntington, which is the cause of Huntington's disease. And um, you know, up until March of this year, this drug, which used to be called HTTRX and is now called Prominosin, was un undoubtedly the, not only the most promising, but also the furthest ahead uh, drug that we had, and it was in a phase three trial. And then in March, I found out basically the same as everyone else that um, Roche, the sponsor of the trial, had been had been basically told to stop the trial um, because um, the Independent Safety Committee had reviewed the data and had concluded that there was no prospect that the drug was going to work. Um, and uh, you know, like I say, I found out the same as everyone else. It was a press release on the uh, press release on the Rush website that, that um, and I got a text message telling me to look at the website. And that's how, unfortunately, you know, that's how these announcements tend to get um, broken. It, it, everyone in the world has to be told at the same time, so that people can't make money from insider trading um, on the basis of information that a trial is about to be halted. Um, and um, that was um, absolutely gutting. You know, I think I think that's probably the lowest point. Uh, that I have felt since I um, started working with HD patients in 2005. Um, and I think it's fine to be really annoyed and sad and angry and despondent and completely uh, at some loss. In the words of Gandalf, I will not say do not weep for not all tears are evil. Um, but then I would say, are you done? <laughs> because uh, nothing else has changed. We need to move on and we need to press on with this mission to uh, m change the future, change the narrative and make Huntington's disease uh, a condition that where we can alter the trajectory. Um, so by all means, take, take, a, take a moment to uh, be annoyed and you know all of the other stuff, but we, all, we really all have to get right back on the horse. It's taken me a while, but I'm, you know, I feel like I'm back at full speed now. And I'm going to talk about what happened, and then I'm going to talk about what's next and what we can all do to make what is next happen more quickly um, and um, make the outcome of the next trials uh, hopefully better than the previous one. But this is basically, you know, let's so let's talk, let's debrief on Tommy Nurse and figure out where we're up to. So in 2017, this was the graph that made me cry with joy um, because. Uh, this was the graph that told us that for the first time ever in all of human history, we had a drug that could um, control um, the production of the mutant Huntington protein in the nervous system of people with Huntington's disease. Um, literally never been done before. Um, and what you can see from left to right is that each line represents one person and um, on the left is the start of the trial and on the right of each graph is the end of the trial. And so basically with increasing doses, increasingly big doses of, of the drug, um, you can see that the Huntington level in the spinal fluid um, was, was lowered um, with greater effect. Um, and that we call that a dose response relationship, but you can also think of it as a volume control knob. In other words, whatever degree of Huntington reduction we want, we can achieve it by altering the dose. Um, and that was brilliant. And looking back, I, would, I think we were all right to be as excited as we were. I think the hope that we had was completely valid and reasonable. Um, and, um, you know, I think it was right to press on at full speed with that program. Would we do things differently now? Maybe. But now we have all the information that has come from the later trials. And, you know, so clearly the main thing is to learn from that and, and fold it in. So um, this was the trial, the Generation HD1 trial. Many of you may have been in it or may have had relatives or friends who were in this trial. Um, and so it was a three arm trial. At the bottom, um, the placebo arm received doses every two months of um, saline, uh, you know, not drug, no active drug. And these were all injected into the spine um, because that's how the drug gets into the brain. At the top, the people in the two monthly arm got doses of active drug every two months. And in the middle, the four monthly arm got alternating drug placebo, drug placebo. Um, and that helps keep the whole study um, blinded. Um, and it was a two year study. Um, unfortunately, the, the data that um, um, caused the safety committee to uh, recommend the halting of the program uh, are shown here. And basically what you can see is that um, the, the orange is the 
four monthly arms, so the less frequently treated arm. Blue is the two monthly arm, gray is the placebo. And as you can see on the right, improved outcome means up. So this is the, this is the composite UHDRS score, which is basically a single number that represents whether someone's getting better or worse. And what we want is for that number to go up. Um, so if the drug was working, the orange and blue um, uh, little uh, spaceshipy things would be above the placebo, but unfortunately they're below. And the two monthly arm, the more frequently treated arm is worse than the four monthly arm, which is worse than the placebo. So everything's in the wrong order, which means that the drug wasn't helping. And there's a suggestion that it may have been making things worse, which is clearly the opposite of what we want. And it was the right decision to stop the trial therefore. Um, the same is shown here. Um, this is total motor score. So this is all of the, you know, the finger tapping and, and this stuff that we do. Um, and again, um, improve that. We want the, we want both arms to be below the gray and, and the orange may be kind of in the right place, but the blue one's not. And anyway, there was essentially no way that they were gonna um, move in the right direction. Um, and, and, and something slightly strange was seen um, in the brain scans as well. So everyone in the trial had several brain scans. I want you to sort of orientate yourself to these two black um, shapes in the middle. And those are the, the ventricles, the lateral ventricles in the brain. So we've sort of sliced, if you slice my face off behind it, this is what it will look like. I and mean, you'll see these two ventricles. It looks like a butterfly, but it's actually fluid. So it's clear, clear fluid filled space that sort of supports the brain. Um, those are the ventricles. And one of the things we do is measure the size of the ventricles as the trial um, proceeds. And um, what you can see here is, is, is really uh, quite uh, striking, which is that the um, ventricles um, got uh, bigger. Um, so the gray, the bigger the, the bigger the ventricles are, the more fluid is in the middle of the brain. And you can see that the two monthly treated arm uh, here, top right in blue, is dramatically bigger, has dramatically bigger ventricles than the people who receive placebo. Everyone's ventricles got bigger because that's what happens when the brain shrinks with HD. But the people on study drug got really big ventricles. Um, and this, this is a measure of the um, total volume, the total sort of mass, if you like, of brain around the ventricles. So this is basically, if you drained all the fluid out of the brain and, and, and weighed it, this is, this, this is an MRI measure of how much brain is left in total. And the weird thing about this is that although the ventricles got uh, much bigger in the treated patients. If you look at these three here, there really isn't much difference um, between any of the three groups. In other words, and this is really genuinely a puzzling finding, the ventricles got bigger in the people who received frequent treatment, but the, the total volume of brain didn't decrease. In other words, the brain, they weren't losing more brain matter, but the ventricles were getting bigger. And to me, that feels like what happens, like if you, if you overinflate a beach ball, it gets bigger, but if you weigh, if you then take all the air out and weigh the beach ball, it won't weigh anymore because um, it, it's simply uh, growing. Whereas if, I think if the, if the drug was actually kind of uh, accelerating the atrophy that we see, the loss of brain matter, then I think we would have seen the, the brain uh, shrinkage measurement go up, but we didn't see that. So it's, it's a bit puzzling. And I think what this amounts to is a situation that we call hydrocephalus. Which, is, which basically means what I've described. The, the ventricles are being pumped up with, with more fluid than should be there, but the brain isn't losing volume. And that might tell us something important. That's, that's not seen in the history of HD. Normally the ventricles get big because the brain is losing mass because the, the neurons are dying. But that doesn't seem to be what was happening in this study. The other thing, and this isn't from the actual study that was just halted, but it's from the long open label extension. So the original people who were in the very first trial carried on getting uh, treatment and, and, and these are the results of the long-term treatment in that open label study. And what you can see here is that on the top is the white, the, the number of white blood cells in the spinal fluid. And on the bottom is the amount of protein in the spinal fluid, total protein, not Huntington protein, but all of the proteins added up. And you can see in both groups, like there's a lot of squibbliness, but basically the tendency is for these to be up and not, and not go down. Like they're not going up and up and up and up, but, but they're kind of going up and staying up. And as a neurologist, when we see that, 
the that is basically the definition of a form of chronic meningitis, not an infection like a bacterial or viral meningitis, but a chronic non-infectious meningitis. And, and that's, an, that's basically evidence, pretty strong evidence that the immune system has been activated in the brain and is, um, is sort of roving around looking for a problem to solve that may or may not be there. But basically we shouldn't really be seeing this degree of immune activation in a drug that's supposed to be helping uh, the brain. So we've got this mixture of immune activation and the ventricles getting bigger. And it all, it's all a bit mysterious, but it's, it's kind of telling us a story, I think. The other thing that happened in that open label extension was that the neurofilament, the level of this pro single protein called neurofilament light went up and then it came down again. Um, and it didn't go down because the drug was stopped, because actually this is a 15 month story that you're looking at here. And in each of the arms of the open label extension study, it went up and then it sort of came down again. And on, in, the, in, the more, in the less frequently uh, treated arm on the right, it actually came down nearly to baseline. Um, and what does that mean? I mean, and so basically neurofilament is a biomarker, a measurement that my, my research has looked at quite a lot. And when neurofilament goes up, it's bad. And it generally means that brain cells are being damaged because neurofilament is a protein inside brain cells when you damage a brain cell, it basically bursts and it spews forth its neurofilament and we measure it. So we see a small rises in neurofilament during the progression of Huntington's disease. And that reflects the rate of the rate at which neurons are being damaged by the disease. But here we saw a rise that's much quicker. But then with, um, with the drug still on board and with the Huntington level actually being more and more suppressed, the neurofilament came down, um, which to me suggests probably something bad happening early on that then either kind of stabilizes or, or sort of goes away. And I think there's a clue here from the design of the study. First thing to notice is that every single dose, every one of these yellow triangles was 120 milligrams. And, and that's, you know, you have, may have to take it from me that 120 milligrams is a lot of this family of drugs. So the drug is made from DNA, um, but it's a sort of customized um, synthetic DNA. 120 milligrams is a bigger dose of that kind of drug than has ever been injected into the human nervous system before. So other drugs like this that are, that are used for other conditions are generally given at much lower doses. But that 120 milligram dose was chosen based on the fact that you remember the little volume control knob graph that I showed with that dose um, in the early study, we got really good Huntington suppression. Um, uh, but uh, you know, having said that, at 90 and 60 milligrams, there was a pretty good degree of lowering as well. So every dose was 120 milligrams. And if you look at the left-hand side of the screen here, in both arms, two monthly and four monthly arms, there's two triangles close together. And that's because each person received the drug at day one and then a month later at day um, 29. So um, two very big doses of 120 milligrams a month apart. And, um, you know, and then about four months later, we see this rise in neurofilament and then it, and then it goes down again. You know, it's, it's, it's a sort of circumstantial evidence, as, as, as uh, Colombo would say. Um, but um, to me, it all sort of, it, it starts to tell a story. And this is, this is my working theory. I'm not speaking on behalf of Roche or the sponsor or um, any, you know, this is not an official uh, position at all. This is just what I think, having reviewed the data and, and um, sort of been involved in some of these decisions throughout the program. So I think it was, I think it was too much ASO. In other words, too much of the drug, too high a dose. And it was given in too fast um, a, a program, particularly at the beginning. And I think that that basically irritated or caused inflammation in the brain. And I think it's important to remember that the, the people who were in all of these um, trial programs were um, people who already had symptoms of HD. And, and we know in that situation, the brain is quite fragile. Like, you know, you, you know if, if your HD loved one has a cold or if you have a cold, or if you hit your head or something, everything gets worse because the, the HD brain is, is much more um, fragile and much more vulnerable to any kind of bad thing happening to it. So a bit of inflammation, a bit of damage directly, I think, caused by the drug um, causes then harm to these vulnerable neurons, brain cells. And unfortunately, I think probably there was a, there was a degree to which the, the neurons um, were, were um, the death of neurons was probably accelerated and that caused the release of this protein neurofilament. It doesn't necessarily mean death, by the way. If neurons are damaged but not killed, that can also release NFL. And I think the jury's out on that. And basically, then the inflammation causes all of these white immune cells, white cells, 
and uh, protein to be pulled out into the CSF and it's part of a, an immune response, but it kind of makes the CSF, which is normally, uh, you know, uh, has the consistency of water. This is water, not gin yet. And um, it, it makes it thick and gloopy um, and sort of syrupy and sticky. And uh, when that happens, it's much more difficult for the CSF to be, the, the CSF is the spinal fluid, to be kind of absorbed. And, and, and that can lead to these pressure effects in which the ventricles get inflated. And when that happens, because of disturbances of pressure possibly in the brain, that can then further enhance this damage to the neurons. So, and I think you, we probably ended up with this cycle of damage from the drug, inflammation, gloopy CSF, bigger ventricles, hydrocephalus, and then, you know, and you end up in a situation where unfortunately, even if the drug is, is a great drug, it's not in a position to show how good it is because of all of this nonsense that's, that's going on in the background. And as with many drugs, um, you, you often, you know, again, many of you will know this, you often get the bad stuff up front and have to wait for the good stuff um, to emerge. But that's not something you can do in a trial that isn't designed to accommodate that. And, and I, th I think the analogy I've kind of settled on is that it's a bit like, you know, if you're the fastest sprinter in the world, for sure, if that's a fact, right, you're Usain Bolt, and the, the starter pistol goes off, and then you get confused and run in the wrong direction. Um, and everyone else is running towards the finish line and you're running backwards. There's no way you're going to win that race. Even if you stop and turn around and start running in the right direction, everyone else is ahead of you and you're, you're not going to win that race. And I think it's possible that that's what happened. Um, you know, the drug, the drug may well be beneficial, but it was unable to show it because it started the race running backwards. And um, so now Rush is, this is where we are. Okay, so Rush basically has to, has to make a decision. On the one hand, uh, they could conclude that the drug isn't worth uh, pursuing, that um, there's no evidence to support uh, any possible benefit. And, and if, that's the right, if that's the situation we're in, then the drug should be killed. And that's the right thing to do. And we shouldn't feel bad about that. Right? We should feel bad that the trial gave us a negative result, but we shouldn't feel bad about discontinuing the development of a drug if there's no reason to believe that it will work. On the other hand, if there is good evidence to suggest from the data that come through that it might work in a particular group of people with a tweaked trial design, then you know it's right for there to be a future trial of this drug, Tominersen. We need to be very careful. And, and in my experience of the, of the people at Rush and the team advising them, this decision will be made correctly and carefully, I think. You, uh, you should make your own judgment, but this isn't going to be called, you know, uh, it's not going to be what's sometimes called a fishing expedition. Rush uh, so far uh, is being very scientific about the approach and basically um, they're, they're testing theories about which group of people or which dosing regimes or, or, or is there evidence of a subset of people where it makes sense that group of people might have shown benefit or a potential for benefit from the drug and if there is only then will it go into another trial they're not just going to take one you know one measurement of little finger strength out of, out of 200 and say look uh, in these people the drug did great so we just throw it at patients again no that's i, I believe uh, with with evidence in my mind that uh, that that's how it's going to be it's, it's going to be a sensible decision um so we may or may not hear more about that. And so a lot of people are rightly asking, you know, why is it taking so long? And the answer is, first of all, um, this is an 800 person trial. Uh, many people are still enrolled in the trial and, and giving data, which are really helpful for finding out what happens when you come off this drug. Um, and uh, even if that weren't the case, uh, there's trial sites all over the world that are still cleaning up the data from, you know, a month or two ago. And, and need to uh, submit all that data and then the, the, they have to get it, get it all in the database. And it's not just data, of course, it's samples, samples of blood and CSF and urine and all sorts of other things, and brain scan from across the world. And the plan was for all of this to happen next year when the trial finished. But in the middle of March, it, the bomb dropped that they had to halt the trial, gather all the samples to them and run all of these tens and tens of thousands of samples in the lab to the standard of um, uh, that's required for, you know, declaring the outcome of a clinical trial. So uh, nothing's being hidden. If there was, a, if there was a, um, a conclusion from the data that had come in or a decision, 
we would know about it. And how I know that we would know is for the same reason that we all found out from that press release back in March. Because as soon as a decision has been taken, or as soon as the company has information that is material to the future of the drug, they're legally required to announce it. So um, I don't think anything's being held back. I share everyone's frustration that, that we haven't heard what's happening next. Uh, but um, I'm optimistic that um, we should hear soon. And, and unfortunately, it's one of those situations where it takes as long as it takes. We have to hurry up and wait, in other words. And this isn't the decision that we want to be rushed. We don't want to rush into another trial. We don't want to rush to, to kill the drug. And um, we need to make the right decision. Already, though, you know, um, there are things that we've learned from this uh, situation that will dramatically improve the chance of future programs being beneficial. And one of them is looking at the ventricles, which we talked about. The one I'll focus on is NFL, which is this protein that I've been interested in for a while. So neurofilament light. And basically, drug hunters talk about this concept of a therapeutic window. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is a picture of a therapeutic window. Um, basically, you know, we want to be inside the tower. Um, but every window has a top and a bottom. And um, if, you, if you are trying to kind of catapult yourself through that window, if you go too high, you're going to hit the wall. If you go too low, you're going to hit the wall. If you go through the window, you'll end up where you want to be. And so it is with drugs. Um, and NFL, uh, it, it turns out, we now know from the program, is potentially really useful for finding the top and bottom of that therapeutic window in Huntington's disease. And in principle, at least, um, we know that um, from other, drug, other diseases, that if a drug is working to save neurons, the NFL will go down. And that tells us we're in the therapeutic window. If we don't give enough drug, NFL won't be altered. And that is a clue, along with other things like the level of Huntington protein, that's a clue that we are too low for the therapeutic window. If, it goes, if, if we're too high, if we're above the therapeutic window, the NFL will go up. And again, we now know from the earlier stages of the Rush program, but that's a warning that the drug probably isn't going to do what we want it to do. So we're going into the next round of trials of Tom and Nursen or whatever other drugs we're testing, um, much better armed for finding the right dose so that we don't go into future trials with a dose that's too high or too low. So that's Tom and Nursen, but of course, that wasn't the only thing that happened in March. Um, seven days later, Wave Life Sciences put out this press release and they were running two, tr two drug trials of, of a Huntington lowering ASO drug. Um, and they pulled out both of their uh, trials. They halted both of their trials. But what, I'm, what I want you to take away from this is that that announcement was very, very different from the Rush announcement for two reasons. The first is, number one, the, the, the WAVE program was a much, much earlier phase program. So the WAVE one, it was doing what the Rush drug was doing in about 2016. So that was the first in human trial. And those are, those are much, much more likely to fail across the board. So that's no surprise when a first in human trial. The second is this result from the WAVE program, um, which basically tells us that the, the WAVE drugs weren't lowering Huntington. The Roche drug did lower Huntington, the volume control knob, um, uh, but that didn't produce clinical benefit in the trial. In the WAVE program, they didn't even get to the first or didn't even get over the first um, hurdle. The drug didn't lower Huntington. And so this is, although this is disappointing, um, this is much less of a um, worrying or uh, it's a failure that we need to, that we need to be much less um, upset about than about the, the Rush um, situation. Uh, so the Rush program lowered Huntington, the WAVE drug didn't. But WAVE is now doing a, a, another trial of a, a, a new uh, drug, which is already being given to people. So everything, you know, nothing, nothing stops forever. Uh, and in fact, in the, in the, in the words of Samwise Gamgee, in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow, this, this feeling of failure and disappointment, even darkness must pass. It sort of doesn't happen automatically though, right? Sam has to go to Mordor and, and, and help uh, Frodo put the ring in the mountain. So back to Galadriel, stray us a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. It sounds pretty depressing. But the point here is that Galadriel then goes on to say, yet hope remains while the company is true. Um, and this is, I think, the thing that we need to remember in, in our current situation. Hope remains while the company is true. I, and she gives Fro Frodo this light. May it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. So I have several 
I want to revisit some several, some basic um, re reminders about our situation as an HD community. Firstly, uh, we know the cause of Huntington's disease. It's the gene, it's the protein, and if we target that, we, have, we still have every reason to expect that it will be effective. Number two, even though the Rush drug didn't work in the phase three trial, we know that we can do that thing that no human has ever done before. We can lower the concentration of the Huntington protein in the nervous system. And the rest really is kind of about tweaking how we get from that to clinical benefit. Yes, and I just want to play you this. Or disappointing. We can come uh, back I'll to pause it for a sec to introduce. So this is me talking at, um, in uh, 2019 at the HDSA convention. Uh, so the results it. are negative or disappointing. We can come back to this. We know that this happened. We know that we can lower Huntington. If for some reason the first trial doesn't produce slowing of the disease, we figure out why. Was it the dosing? Was it the regime? Was it injected in the wrong place? Was it injected in the wrong patients? We'll figure it out and the next trial will be better. We've done it before, we'll do it again. We can always come back to December the 11th, 2017. That is our new save point for how to develop therapies for Huntington's disease. And then I went on about the infinity stones. But the point is, um, we all the reason we do trials, every single trial, the reason we do it is because we do not know whether the drug is gonna be helpful or harmful or useless, just do nothing. Um, and uh, each trial only tests the doses that it's tested in, right? So we still don't know whether the drug is helpful or harmful or useless, but we do know that the regimes and the concentrations that were tested for that drug are uh, no good and we need to rethink. But, you know, that's where we are. We knew we might end up here and that's where we are. And we'd always, we always knew what we would need to do to get past that. So the, um, the, the third point is that it's, it is still true that a treatment that slows progression of the disease should also work in people who have a mutation but um, no symptoms of HD to prevent or delay the onset of the disease. And that's still true, and that is still what we are working towards. And a little bit, little more on that later. And, and for number four, Jimmy said this already, science is cumulative, right? Uh, every day, we know more than we knew yesterday. And some days, the things we find out are things we rather than we didn't know, right? Or, or news that we wish we hadn't had. But even that, even the news that this drug dose doesn't work moves us forward as long as we pay attention to the lessons and stick together. And as Lady Galadriel said, the company is true. We are the company, you are the company, the global Huntington's disease community remains true to the cause, committed, energized, and as optimistic as we can be in the circumstances because uh, time is ticking off, and in the words of um, Aragorn, a day may come when courage fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. This day we fight, and that's what we need to do. We need to get back on the horse. Thanks, Aragorn. So from my perspective, at least, Huntington lowering is alive and kicking, right? It's still the right thing to do, and here's the headlines about what's happening now and next. So um, let's remind ourselves of where we are. It wasn't, it was never all, all about Tommy Nursen and all about the ASO trial. Um, so here's where we are. Um, the gene uh, it is a recipe for the protein. And in the middle is this thing called mRNA, which is the thing that we can uh, kind of monkey about with. So viral gene therapies involve putting a, putting a, a, a set of additional instructions into cells using a friendly virus and then that produces an, a, a, a special um, RNA that wouldn't normally be there, which can stick to the RNA message from the Huntington protein. And when that happens, it gets deleted and then the protein um, doesn't get made. So um, Unicure, uh, two years ago now, became the first company to put a, a, a Huntington lowering viral uh, gene therapy into uh, the brains of HD patients. This is a slide we've been showing until now because this is a scan from a pig before they treated any people. But earlier on this year, they finally showed us um, this, these amazing pictures of, the, of human HD patients having these viruses injected into their brain and the white blob that you can see here um, is the, is the, the, the viral, um, the solution containing the therapeutic virus being injected and slowly spreading through the part of the brain that they're aiming to treat. Absolutely incredible pictures, and it's totally new era for Huntington's disease. Um, and this, you know, this will tell us from a different angle um, whether Huntington lowering can work. 
um, whether it's safe and eventually whether it is actually going to slow the progression of the disease. Um, but so I want to talk um, about an, an, another important new era, which is about to begin. And when I say about to, it's probably going to begin in the, before Christmas. OK, so that's that's where we're up to. And it's this concept of splicing, because as ever in biology, the picture is a little bit more complicated than this gene mRNA protein. And, and that's because of this process called splicing. So the, you, the word splicing, you may know from how they how they make how they used to make movies with, you know, they would cut the the uh, film and stitch it together again and then get rid of the bit they didn't want and that's splicing and RNA is, a, is kind of the same the RNA that's actually produced is called pre-mRNA and um, it, it contains some stuff that you want like the pink and the orange and it but it also contains some stretches that you don't want that the directors decided to get rid of like this blue stretch and that's where these uh, this process of splicing comes in and it's all happening on a molecular level inside our cells um, but basically, um, the cell knows how to do it because the instructions are contained in the in the uh, in the film. Um, and so basically, it, it reads the sequences and it says, "Oh, there's an instruction that says cut here and join to here." And and then you know what you, what you end up getting is the protein that your cell um, intended, and the stuff you don't want gets uh, gets ignored basically. But this is a process where we can actually monkey around with the machinery that that um, that does it. And if we're very careful then we should be able to actually make a difference in a way that's really meaningful and desirable. So for a while, there's been several people, several companies developing these drugs called splicing modulators. And what they do is they basically monkey around with the um, scissors that cut the RNA. And, and when that happens, you basically can keep in the movie scenes that would otherwise have been cut out. And then so you get a, set, a different set of instructions and if you're really clever, what you can do is you can include in the final movie that goes to cinemas, a scene that contains a stop instruction. And this is like as if the director had shot a, a, a video of himself or herself saying, uh, I want you to stop watching this movie and leave the cinema immediately. Um, and so what ends up being seen is, in cinemas is, is half a movie and then an instruction to leave. And so basically the protein doesn't get made right because you've you've kind of poisoned the set of instructions by including this bit of information that would otherwise have not have not have been there and so this is this is the concept of splicing modulation and actually thanks to huge developments in this field this can be done in an incredibly um, targeted way um and uh it's now uh reaching the stage where these drugs are being given to pick to people human beings with and without Huntington's disease PTC Therapeutics has this drug called PTC518, and this is a pill, right? This isn't an injection into any part of the body. It's a pill that's swallowed and it reduces the production of Huntington protein, not just in the brain and not just in a tiny part of the brain, but in the whole body. Remarkable. On the right, uh, the, on the right is data from mice, on the left is data from humans. And, and a few weeks ago, PTC announced the design of their uh, the first study that will test this drug in patients, and it's called Pivot HD, um, and we're expecting it to come to the UK as well as other parts of the world, recruiting 100 to 150 patients. And their aim is really ambitious. They're aiming to initiate this trial before the end of this year. And the trial actually has a really innovative design, which at least in principle means that it might be able to in include people who haven't yet received a formal diagnosis of HD. So what we used to sort of call pre-manifest or prodromal HD mutation carriers, really innovative. So they're kind of shooting for the moon. The idea is that they will use neurofilament and other biomarkers to show that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do um, and, and hopefully end up um, being able to accelerate the development and licensing of the drug as a preventative as well as a treatment for people who already have symptoms. And as she was very uh, presciently indicated, like London buses that, that come along, you wait ages for them and they come along uh, several at once. So it is with Huntington lowering drugs. And there's this drug called Branaplan that was developed by Novartis for a disease of children called spinal muscular atrophy, but it's a splicing modulator. And so it's trying to alter the um, production of, uh, of different proteins. And um, along the way, Novartis made a discovery. Something happened that, that Novartis did not intend, which was that they discovered almost by accident when they looked in the blood of the kids that were treated with this drug, that it was actually lowering the production of Huntington protein 
which is exactly what we want to do. And it's exactly what we've wanted to do all along. Um, so it's the kind of luck that almost never happens, but it's definitely a real thing. Um, and it's been demonstrated, uh, you know, and quite robustly in human beings. And Novartis, um, and Novartis trial doesn't have a sexy name, unfortunately. It's the, the Novartis Huntington lowering drug. Um, if, if, if that's wrong, by the way, anyone from Novartis who may be listening, let me know and I'll, I'll tweet the name of the trial, but I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a sexy name. Um, so that trial, uh, they're already in communication with clinical sites about that trial. Details were announced at the EHDN meeting a couple of months ago, and it's, it's almost certain that that drug will start being given to HD patients this year. Um, I'll, I'll need to speed up a little bit. Um, so uh, the, other, the other big th thing that's happening in the next 12-ish months is this concept of somatic instability, which is the idea that although your CAG repeat in blood doesn't change throughout life, sometimes some cells of the brain may end up with more CAGs, and if your brain is one that tends to get these bigger CAGs as time goes on, then um, that is something that could potentially have a big difference. And it, it could be something that we want to slow down. And huge genetic studies that, if, that you may have contributed to if you're in, in role HD have told us that this whole group of machinery called DNA repair proteins has a bearing on this tendency of the CAG to get bigger. So if we have drugs that can interfere with the DNA repair in a way that makes it um, more helpful than harmful, then that could be something that could have a big impact preventing HD, um, uh, you know, before these expansions can occur. And triplet therapeutics um, has this uh, compound, their, their um, uh, definitive drug called TTX3360, which sounds very futuristic, targeting this DNA repair um, pathway called MSH3. And this is an, an, another ASO drug, so it's, uh, it's a DNA a drug that's made of DNA, but in order to, to reduce the amount of milligrams that they need to inject, they're actually talking about and planning to inject the drug directly into the ventricles um, because then you don't have to give such big doses in order to get the drug um, where it needs to go. So it's a very innovative design. Um, it'd be very unusual and it'd be a new territory for us, but if it works, then um, this could be a drug that has a really important place. Um, and there are, of course, other studies going on. You may be familiar with the Proof HD study, the Annexon trial, or the Neurocrine study. So, you know, these are targeting uh, things that are much less fundamental in HD than the gene and the protein itself. Um, but, of course, you know, the, I, what it reflects really is that there is, there is still a huge interest and uh, involvement of many different um, pharmaceutical companies, as well as all of the researchers around the world, really um, carrying on uh, completely um, unabated, really, especially now that the pandemic is, is things are better than they were a year ago with the pandemic. So um, we're really kind of back up to full speed when it comes to trials and research and, and so on. So in the words of Gandalf, all we have to do is decide, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I, and I think that's a, that's a really important lesson. I've always said that. And now is the, a really important time to decide. Because the question is, what can we all do to make sure that this doesn't take any longer than it needs to, and to make sure that we all get beyond this setback and learn from it? And then once again, back to Sam, it's the job that's never started as takes longest to finish. So, um, you know, what and again, it comes back to back to some quite basic stuff that I've been saying for years. If you're not part of Enroll HD, please take part in Enroll HD. It, it, it helps us to understand Huntington's disease, and it also um, it for, uh, serves as the database the, of tri potential trial volunteers. Um, and the more people in Enroll HD, the more quickly we can recruit into the clinical trials. Um, I, I want to mention my um, study, HD Clarity. I'm the a chief investigator of HD Clarity, but it's funded by um, CHDI Foundation. And all along, the role, the, the, the job of HD Clarity has been to collect um, samples of spinal fluid along with data from HD patients and controls with the view of um, uh, firmly establishing the role of biomarkers like neurofilament light. The idea of those biomarkers is that that is how we will end up in a state where we have enough information to be able to test um, drugs to prevent the onset of Huntington's disease um, and, and therefore um, produce the maximum benefit as soon as we have a drug that does work. 
uh, we're not there yet. We don't have enough samples in the freezer from HD Clarity to be able to go to the FDA and the EMA and the MHRA and say, uh, this is how we're going to prevent Huntington's disease. So um, HD Clarity is very much back up and running, having, having had, uh, you know, obviously had to pause activity at various sites throughout the pandemic. If you're, if you're at an, a site that has Enroll HD, ask about, ask about HD Clarity, or you can visit the website hdclarity.net. Um, and um, if, you, uh, if you're up for it, then um, donating your CSF uh, is an incredibly um, uh, imp uh, important and valuable thing uh, to do. If you can't do any of those things, please consider being a wingman or a wing person for someone else um, to help them take part in enroll or clarity or a clinical trial or any research really that's, that's running at, at, through the HD um, service. And so my message at the end is the same as it was last year. The last year it was about the pandemic, but this year it's kind of more general. Uh, science has uh, kind of saved the human race already this year in the form of uh, the vaccines uh, to overcome the pandemic. And um, to me, that's a real kind of beacon of what, what science can do if enough people get behind it. And um, I, I continue to believe that there's some good in the world and it's worth fighting for. And, um, you know, as ever, I look forward to being alongside all of you. Um, as we fight to change the future. Uh, so I'm just happy to take questions if, if I haven't talked for too long. No, we can take some questions. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for explaining it so clearly. Uh, uh, that really helps, I think. So we do have a question in the Q&A. Uh, this is a question, okay. Notwithstanding the likelihood of information, do you think some of the results could be explained by a difference in the groups to start with? Do you think that future trials there might be a need for a tighter criteria for taking part to ensure that each of the groups is as similar as possible or a run-in period starting on a drug to make sure that it's possible to have an idea of the rate of progression for each of the individual individuals before the drug is started? That's a really um, in, insightful question. Um, thankfully, I think the answer is no because of the sheer size of the trial and the fact that it was randomised. Obviously, one of the things that will need to happen is to go back and make sure that the groups were well balanced. But from what we know going on, that's a check that's kind of made as you go along. And, and I think that they probably were well balanced um, and randomized um, equally. So, and actually halfway through the trial, because uh, things were going well and because the recruitment had been so incredible from the community, um, the numbers were increased. It was initially a 600 person trial and it was increased to an 800 person trial. And if anything, that should have, that should have um, really uh, in, um, uh, helped to ensure that there were no kind of random effects um, causing a lack of balance between the groups. But I really, um, touching on the second point, the idea of running, that's a design that can be considered, but I think what it really, what it really um, implies is a much more person-centered individualized approach to Huntington lowering. And I think, you know, what I, another thing that I've sort of been banging on about is if we, is the possibility that, 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 that a one size fits all approach isn't a smart way to, to try and lower Huntington. Um, and I use the analogy of insulin. If you discovered insulin and then decided to try and cure diabetes by giving 800 patients, a hundred units of insulin every day, some of them might do really well, but some of them would die because that's too much. And, um, you know, we give insulin according to things like the size of the person and what they've eaten and their current sugar level. And then we measure the, the, what happens to the sugar level. And then we give another dose of insulin later on based on what happened. And then over the, over the longer term, we measure other biomarkers, HbA1c for any, any insulin fans in the audience. Um, and, you know, we, so we tailor the dose to the response. We have that option in, in these Huntington lowering trials, right? We can measure each person's individual Huntington level and we can measure each person's individual neurofilament level. And if your Huntington level is really, really low, but your neurofilament level's gone up, well, that's a potential warning sign that you're being overdosed, you're being given too much. And so I think I would really like to see a bit more in the way of personalized um, approaches within the clinical trial setting. And I suspect I have a good reason to suspect that future trial designs may well include um, the option of um, uh, the option of avoiding uh, over or underdosing 
by including some of those measures. Thank you so much for taking time on that city Saturday to come and talk to all the 120 something of us. And yeah. um, it, really, it was really nice to meet you again, face to face and drink a <laughs> glass of beer in a bar with another yeah. researcher, which I haven't done for a very long time. And there's lots of comments in the chat saying thanks very much for coming. Thanks and for listening, really everyone. It. Okay. See you again soon. See you again soon. Bye. So uh, we're just going to the end of the meeting now. And um, so it's just time for me to say a, a big thanks uh, to Kath and Ruth and Helen and Anna and all the other people behind the scenes who are paddling like fury while um, where uh, people like me are just uh, talking. They're doing all sorts of organizing and months in advance for, for an AGM. Um, I would remind you to, you can go and get your Amaryllis uh, if you go and check the website, it's a perfect, um, perfect Christmas present for anybody. And also get the Christmas cards as well from the HDA. And uh, of course we'd welcome all, any of your feedback about the meeting and feedback about anything. And really looking forward to seeing you, uh, if not next year, then sometime before that, I hope. Okay, thanks very much, everybody, and goodbye.